<laughs> Hello, welcome everyone. Today is Thursday, October 27th of the Arlington Public School um, meeting. Um, to start out, I'd like to talk about some of the art that we have here. Um, over to left, grade three, Stormy Seas. The third grade students create Stormy Sea paintings inspired by many different artists such as J.M.W. Turner, Hakusai, and contemporary marathon artist blogger G. Corradino. Stormy Sea paintings are a common theme among artists all over the world and across all time periods. Uh, students in third grade observed and discussed various paintings of Stormy Seas and discussed how they may have tied into art history. They then learned to use how to how to use watercolor paint in a unique way to create a soft effect for their own interpretation of stormy seas. Uh, over here, grade four, paper strip sculptures. The fourth grade students create paper, script, paper sculptures using strips of paper, inspired by the sculptures of Susan Shutan. Shutan is an insulation artist who uses tar roofing paper cut into strips to create large abstract sculptures. She uses the roofing paper as a commentary on human carbon footprints and how much we leave behind. The students in fourth grade observed and discussed various installation sculptures of Shutan and how they were created. They were then asked to create their own sculptures that hang in the same way using construction paper strips. Grade back in the back behind you guys, uh, grade five personal masks. The fifth grade students created paper masks inspired by the mixed media mask of Teresa White, a contemporary sculptor whose masks and other sculptures portray her own ancestry and connection with the Yupik tribe and Inuit tribe in Alaska. Her masks are very personal to her and have special meaning. The students in fifth grade observed and discussed various masks of white, their personal meaning, and how they are created. They are then asked to create their, their paper and our mixed media masks that portrayed some kind of personal meaning to them. And over here, um, so these, by the way, are, I believe, all Bishop and Hardy students of the yes. right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, over here, um, to the right of me, um, grade two, Fraudage Creations. The second grade students created Fraudage Creations inspired by Max Ernst, a German painter, sculptor, graphic artist, and poet. Ernst helped to create the surrealist and data styles of art and created a style of art called Fraudage, which he would use pencils and other drawing media to create a rubbing of a textured surface. Mm -hmm. The students in second grade observed and discussed Ernst's artwork and how he created his pieces. They discussed what texture means and how it can be incorporated into their own ar artwork. Then they were asked to create their creature mass with texture using OTAD paper and make a rubbing of that. They then drew the rest of the creature's body and used plastic textile plates to finish off their frontage. Okay, and over here, grade one, abstract collage. The first grade students created mixed media abstract collages inspired by various artists, including Miriam Kutulis, a contemporary artist from Washington, D.C. Kutulis works in various media and creates beautiful abstract collages using maps, newspapers, pattern papers, and paint. The students in first grade observed and discussed Kutulis's artwork and how she created her pieces. Then they learned about mixed media art and how it refers to artwork that uses more than one art medium or material that artists use to create their artwork. First, the students were asked to create their own patterns on many papers to make them more interesting. The next class, the students were asked to create their own mixed media collage using the pattern paper they created the week before. Uh, great, it's always great to see beautiful student work and I apologize for butchering some of those names. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Jason Levy, who is our AA representative and our student's name again is Lucy. Lucy, welcome. Thank you for coming, really appreciate it. Uh, is there any uh, public participation? No. No, okay. Okay, so, um, no, why did I do that? Because <laughs> it's fun. I don't know. Um, next item, uh, we're going to meet um, the interim principal at Audison. We've all been uh, very eager to meet her formally. Um, we've heard um, that she's been doing a fabulous job, and some of us have seen that in person, and some have just heard it from others. Um, but please, uh, we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Eileen Woods. While she's making her way up. Um, I, I, this is the second time in her career that she's been introduced to the school committee. As you all know, uh, she served for two years as the interim principal at Dallin. And in between that stay here, she's also been in Wakefield and Brookline, Brookline last year. So welcome and um, thank you for coming back to Arlington this year. Well, it's it's really a pleasure to come back to Arlington. So I thank you uh, for welcoming me back. 
Um, I know that I have joined a, an exceptional group of educators um, and a very supportive culture uh, here in Arlington and also at the Audison Middle School. Uh, the team of teachers at Audison are talented and dedicated professionals, uh, and they are very committed to uh, the middle school students. The students work hard, they're respectful, they're responsible kids, and they're supported by uh, wonderful families. Uh, it's a diverse community, and we will be celebrating and welcoming all of you to the Inside Out Project um, about the Audison Story, which is an art installation on Saturday, October 29th uh, from 11 to 1. Um, at Audison, um, every day we continue to build a supportive, inclusive community uh, where everyone is welcome. And I want to um, just highlight a few um, projects that have gone on um, with our exceptional students at Audison and teachers. Um, we have uh, really worked hard this year to implement a advisory program. Um, our Students had a wonderful celebration in September of Alley Week, our LGBTQ students, and I uh, want to make sure that you know uh, what wonderful leaders they are at the school. Um, lots of clubs are starting up, math club and robotics and engineering technology. Um, we have a project uh, following our uh, Inside Out project, which is I Am Wall. Uh, where students are leading that, our peer leaders are leading that. Um, we hope in January to uh, celebrate Martin Luther King and with emphasis on uh, teaching empathy and um, the kids are going to be talking about standing in my shoes and we have literature to go along with that. I have a uh, lunch group that comes um, to see me and they talk um, about today celebrating um, black history. Uh, we have a um, theme at Audison, which is um, be the best you, uh, be the best version of yourself, not only for our students, but for all of the faculty and staff. And so we will be recognizing students at the end of each quarter um, who exhibit qualities of being the best you. We had a wonderful um, training yesterday with our peer leaders um, from a world of difference. We trained 31 more peer leaders and um, diversity leaders, and we have, I think, trained over 25. So um, we're looking for the voice of the students in the school as leaders. Um, as a faculty, we share best practices, instructional practices, we're working with the department chairs on the high leverage practice of uh, student engagement. And each day we work the norms of collegiality, open honest communication, and uh, appreciation for each other. Um, in January, we're going to do restorative justice training. In, oh, actually, in November, we're going to be doing some diversity training with the faculty and lots of things happening at Audison, so mm -hmm. I don't want to keep going on and on and take all your time. <laughs> but happy to be here, and, um, and it, it is a really wonderful school to serve. Questions, comments? Yes, Dr. Alessandri. So, welcome. <laughs> um, so, I just a quick question about the Inside Out celebration, just for people who are watching at home, are, is all the public invited? Yes, all the public is invited, and we would love to have, it's gonna be outside, so uh, we have lots of room. And maybe you could tell a little bit what it is. Um. Uh, the Inside Out Project was based in the work of J.R. and artist who took photographs of people, um, it actually took photographs of people at New York City and the Mexican border, and different, it, it's, it's to, to display your community. And so um, even in, um, I think it was, it may have been Germany, it was the LGBTQ community, they had photographs, he took photographs. And then you display the photographs on the, on the building or 
in Mexico. They displayed them right at the wall. And so um, I do want to recognize the, the uh, teachers at uh, Audison who uh, were the um, designers of this and, and also the um, Arlington Fund for Education has supported this project as well. So um, it's really telling the story of um, the wonderful um, students that we have at Audison and you know we have probably over students coming from you know 50 different um, countries and um, they in, in our peer leader group yesterday we realized that they spoke 13 languages so it's really a celebration of our diversity and um, and I really thank the our teachers for putting this forward last year um, and it's been wonderfully received by the kids the kids are really leading it so it's, it's, it's great thank it's you really great. yeah yes mr. Carden uh, so on behalf of the Dowling community, and we're, we're all glad to have you back in Arlington. Um, we know from experience that you're not just a placeholder, you really accomplish things while you're here. So we're glad to have you and look forward to seeing your work throughout the year. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Yes, Mr. Slickin. I'm just saying uh, welcome home. Uh, it's good uh, to have you mm -hmm, back. Yeah. Have you uh, run into many of your former Dowling students? I and have. Yes. And uh, what sort of a reception have you given I, each other? I have gotten a very nice few hugs and they remembered um, be the one, which was what was which was a theme over there. So, um, and actually, a few of their families told me that they still tell them to be the one. So, mm -hmm. so that's great. Yeah, no, they they they've been very welcoming. Yeah. I can imagine it's so, nice to have that little welcoming committee. It is. It is to show you the ropes of the school. It is. It is. Yes, you are correct. Yep, it is. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you back, and I hope you have a great year. So, uh, you're almost a quarter of the way through already. I, yeah. I know. It's going fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, going fast. But lots to do. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wait, I just have a personal thing to say. Um, so oftentimes parents seek me out to complain about things, as you <laughs> wouldn't be surprised. Um, this year I had several parents seek me out to say how well the process has been at Audison, you know, really to, to say good things, which as I said, is not a common thing <laughs> necessarily, just because people like, you know, not that there aren't great things going on, but that's, right. you know, but um, it was very notable to, to see that. Yeah, thank so, you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Anything? Anything else? Or should we go? Uh, so the next item, we're um, having a special education report. Uh, this was actually something we had originally wanted to have a report last spring, and were delayed. <laughs> um, but for, good um, reasons. for very, very good reasons. Um, but we're glad that we're finally um, getting a chance to hear about the the issues at special education. Sure. So um, I brought a, a few of my friends tonight, mm -hmm. um, but um, so. Just to go a little bit over, I guess it'll take a moment to get queued up. Um, one of the slides is introducing folks, so I'll just take the opportunity now. So we have several of our um, special ed coordinators who are our special ed administrators here, and we have Chris Carlson, who's our out of district coordinator. Um, we have Craig Haas, who is an elementary coordinator who's new this year. Um, Stephanie Greiner, who in the past has been a team chairperson, but is the Audison Middle School coordinator. And Elizabeth Logue is a new elementary coordinator. And Joyce Schlinger, who has been here, is our um, early childhood coordinator or preschool director. Uh, Lynn Bennett, the high school coordinator, was unable to come tonight. Um, we also have staff who are going to present. And we have Megan Burke, who is a social worker over at Dallin. Um, Joanna Dimmick, that is Dimmick or Dimmick? Dimmick, that's what I thought, uh, uh, who is our BCBA, um, who works in several of our schools, but specifically with the program over at Dallin. Thad Digman, who you know is the principal at Dowen. And then we have Mogali Olander and um, Lauren Peterson, who are a uh, social worker and speech and language pathologist at the High School Reach program. So and now we're ready to go. So um, again, those were just recognizing um, part of what we call our special ed leadership team. We also have team chairpersons who are AEA uh, members, but we do find that they are leaders in our special ed program programming as well. Um, uh, just an overview of the programming that we have here in the district. So we start as early as three-year-olds. So the Monotomy Preschool is an integrated preschool program. Um, 
Under the federal regulations, we are required to start serving students as young as age three when they're identified. Um, but we run an integrated preschool program for students ages three to five, and that um, combines uh, students who receive special ed services with um, typical peer role models as well. At the elementary level, we have supported learning centers, which are our, you know, what we would call our special ed programs or sub-separate programs. Um, we have them at Brackett, which serves students with intellectual disabilities, Dallin, serving students with social emotional needs, and Stratton, serving students with autism spectrum disorders. Those programs continue through middle and high school. Um, their names change. I wasn't here for the history of that name change, but they uh, become Compass, uh, which uh, again serves students with intellectual disabilities, Reach, which serves students with autism spectrum disorders and social cognition pragmatic needs and Summit, which serves students with social emotional needs. Um, just some stats about it, the district. We have, uh, as of uh, last week when we pulled this data, 873 students receiving special ed services. Um, eight, 742 of those students we serve in district. Uh, 108 of them we serve in out of district placements. Uh, we also have what's called services only. Um, under our child find obligations, we are required to um, affirmatively find um, and serve students in the Arlington community who um, are eligible for special ed services, even if their parents have parentally placed them at private schools. So we do serve 23 students um, who come in just for services. Um, there's more that are eligible. Currently, 23 students take advantage of that service. Um, Again, as I said, at Anatomy, we have um, 34 students uh, who are in our special ed program and then 40 typical uh, peers. And then we also serve an additional 21 students through drop-in services. They may be in private preschools, they may be at home, they just come in for um, individual services and don't have what we call as a seat at the program. Um, and then you can see the totals for the other schools. Um, I put an asterisk next to the ones that have programs. You'll see that those schools tend to have higher special ed populations. Obviously, we've concentrated um, programs there, so there would be a higher incidence of students with disabilities. Um, in our out-of-district placements, uh, 31 students are served in public day placements, which are known as our special ed collaboratives. We are members of uh, EDCO and uh, Lab Collaborative. However, we have students in CASE Collaborative, SEAM Collaborative. Um, possibly Valley Collaborative. Um, so those are considered public day placements. Another 60 students are served in private day placements, which are the Massachusetts approved private schools. Um, and then 14 students are in residential placements. And then two students we have being served through home hospital, uh, meaning at their home, they're not able to attend school. Um, we have an additional, because of uh, some of the group homes in the town, we do serve as programmatic, um, programmatically responsible for students who are in out-of-district placements. We don't have a fiscal responsibility for them. Their home district does, but so we have an additional four students in public day placements, three in private day, and then um, another student in special ed in institutional settings. Um, one of the things that I've mentioned uh, in previous uh, uh, meetings is that we. this is our year for the coordinated program review. That's conducted every six years by the Department of Ele Elementary and Special Secondary Education. Um, they're going to review civil rights, English language education, and special education. Uh, the review consists of two main parts. Last spring, uh, we all participated in what's the self-assessment. It's an online um, assessment which we review our own records, submit the findings from our record review. We also then go through our policy and procedure upload where we have to, for special education, we have 57 criteria that we need to report on. Um, Dr. Chesson has been handling it for civil rights and Carla Bruzzese has been handling it for um, English language education. They will now be on site um, in November to do the second part. Um, they'll do an additional record review on site which is more spot checking. Um, of the records and then they will be visiting um, our schools. The, they will be making site visits not to necessarily observe instruction but to look at the equity of our instructional spaces, the groupings of students, the size and location of, of where we deliver services and then they'll also use that time to um, interview staff and they'll meet with administrators, teachers, 
uh, teacher assistants, related service providers, um, to interview them to, and that's where they're going to really see, you know, are the policies and procedures that we said we have in place actually, you know, what we're practicing. They also will interview um, the CPAC, uh, representative sample from the CPAC. Uh, parents who wish to give per, uh, input can and have been submitting their names. They'll receive um, a phone interview after the site visit. Uh, any student whose record was reviewed, their families will also receive a survey. Uh, and again, just the timeline, they'll be here for the record review November 15th and 16th, and that's where they'll actually be physically up here just going through the records. Um, and at that time, they'll be reviewing special ed and English language learner student records. Uh, and then they will be back on site uh, the week after Thanksgiving to conduct their site visits. There'll be three individuals who come and uh, divide up the schools and the visits on those three days. Um, as I mentioned, they'll conduct phone interviews with interested families in December. Uh, about two to three months after the visit, we can anticipate a uh, draft report. We will have 10 days to respond to that report and correct any factual inaccuracies. And then they'll issue a final report within four to six months after their visit. If there are findings and we are issued corrective action, we all have 20 days to submit our um, corrective action plan. Um, tonight, what the teachers are here to present about, and when we ask about what is the work that special ed has been doing um, over the last few years since I've been here, we've really started to work on program development. A lot of time was spent developing the program, uh, programs that we have, maybe six to eight at this point, 10 years ago probably is when it really started. Um, so now it seems that we're at a natural time where we can review the programs, look how the population has shifted or changed. Um, and we have been working with Wadiko Children's Services to do that. Uh, Wadiko is based out of Boston. Some people might be familiar. They do have a residential school in New Hampshire and summer program, but they also have consulting services uh, where they work with school-based teams. One of the things that um, really has been a, a nice fit with us is that unlike typical consultants where they'll come in, they might interview people, they might make observations, and then they'll submit you a list of recommendations and kind of leave. Um, what they really do is they work with our team so that our teams are doing the assessments of their own programs. Our teams are planning the interventions. They're researching you know, the interventions, planning the implementation. And WDECO is really facilitating that process. So in that way, it's professional development for our staff so that we don't always need WDECO to help us with that. And, um, Dallin has really gotten to the point where they're at their own self-assessment stage, having worked with them for close to two years now. So um, I'm going to turn it over to the teams I just did wanted to add. We originally started with um, Dallin, the Summit Program at Audison, and then um, Millbrook and Reach at the high school. That was in our first year. And now we have um, the consultants working with all three of the SLCs at elementary reaching summit at Audison and working with all the four programs at the high school. So do you, Dallin, want to start? Or did you want to? You're all going together. Yeah. Okay, great. I mean, it's a collaborative model. So again, my name is Megan Burke. I'm one of the social workers who works over at the Dallas School, specifically with the Supported Learning Center. I'm Magali Olander, social worker in the REACH, which is the Autism Spectrum Program program uh, profile program at the high school. And I'm Lauren Peterson, the speech and language pathologist at the high school. And Joanna Demick is our BCBA, who works across the district, but will join us kind of when when it's up and she is ready. Um, so we have about the next 10 minutes together to talk about um, our shared experiencing um, with programming and program development through the WDECO consultation. Um, and just to start a conversation, we understand that this is a pretty brief time period and we'd love to continue the conversation along with anyone who is interested in having it. Um, 
we, as we think about kind of launching into this conversation, we thought it could be helpful to start with a couple of questions for you, which you do not have to answer. You can just think amongst yourselves of what do you already know about the special education programming in town, um, how they're structured, supported, resourced, um, what do the programs do, and what interventions do the programs use? Text support. Oh, text support. Away. <laughs> Um, tech support is on the way. So um, specifically, we realize that our SLC, SLC students cut across diagnostic criteria, and the important functional concern is their inability to access the curricula due to a variety of needs that require some significant support in a substantially separate setting, and that can um, provide a continuum of support. So one of the things that I think is often a misconception is that a, a substantially separate setting may mean that a child doesn't include at all, and really we see a majority of our kids including in a range of supports in both the general ed and special ed settings kind of across our days. And the programming in district, that number was really cool to see how many kids are in district. Yeah. Continue to let the students receive all the specialized support and then have access to the richness that public schools provide. We see that so much at the high school with the, with the different curricula that are available at the different levels and the enrichment stuff, um, which is nice for our students to access. Oh, um, ah, we're up. So, so guys, um, that is a microphone. It won't actually amplify your voice, but if you could speak into it when you're talking that way, it gets to the uh, TV. Oh, oh okay. TV. <laughs> you're on TV. You're on TV. You're on TV. Yes. You're on TV. <laughs> oh, you do. Cool. Nice. Um, all right. So the uh, Wudiko came in, um, and, I, and I'll be honest, we were a little hesitant when this started. For those of us who have been in district for um, a couple of years, we've been through a couple of models of consultation, um, and we said, okay, like we'll buy in, but we need to see some action and some change. Um, and I have to say that this was a really empowering process, specifically for our two teams. Um, and they introduced the idea of the logic model, um, where we began with an assessment of student needs and then conceptualized some program models, some interventions and to meet those targeted needs, and then some evaluation. Um, and the Dallin team, I think, is the one team in district that has gotten to that phase. Um, and it was really fascinating to see with fidelity that we were implementing all of these things that we said we were going to be implementing, and very and exciting. I mean, we certainly had growth areas and areas to move from. But the ability to go through this process and then to realize that this is a process we can continue going through on our own was a really powerful experience. So I'll let the, the REACH team jump in on what the process looked like. Again, uh, can you just we'll move the mic right? Yeah, excellent. All right. <laughs> Perfect. So um, Wadiko, the logic model that Wadiko sort of offers as a frame moves you through a process of identifying needs, figuring out what is already going in, figuring out what the programs are supposed to be putting out, giving back to the students and the community, the needs of that community, and then what are the outcomes? What is, what's happening? Is it working? And that sort of follows the, that circular diagram that Megan just showed, but it's a very organizing and structured way of thinking about the work that we're doing, and it really did prove to be quite helpful at, at organizing our thinking and, and structuring our, our, next, our, our next steps. So as we think about how this was helpful for us, taking um, one of the biggest focuses we've had is having our program become structure dependent versus person dependent. So God forbid one of us runs off to Hawaii or something like that. Everything is still up and running. Um, and so it was really helpful identifying needs. So we have program specific orientations that have been supported by the district before school starts. So our staff start the year ready to go. Um, we have determined program-wide professional development from levels to TAs to teaching assistants to BSPs so our behavior support personnel to our related service providers working with the programs. And we've identified needs around staffing, physical space. Um, we've really learned to prioritize and carve out time for meetings to be able to continue this work within our school days. Um, and so it was, it was helpful to um, identify what we're currently doing, identify what we want to be doing, and then have some good data to come back to our administrators who are supporting us through this process to help kind of advocate for those resources. And while the steps of the logic model look rather basic and simple, there were many, many other steps along the way within each of those that really, really broke down skills into very small pieces and, and all the elements of our program. So when we were looking at student needs, 
we were breaking things down into you know, some of the most minimal, smallest interventions that we're putting in place and was able to give us a really good perspective, even though it's the things that we're doing every single day with all of our students, but to be able to see how much of that impact we're doing and why. I mean, we were consistently asked throughout the process, but why are you doing those? How do you know that those are the right interventions? What are the outcomes that we're seeing? Are they effective and how to do that? And it was a really nice process to help us see all of those small pieces as we look to the big picture. It was, um, it was fascinating because both the Wadigo consultant and our special ed administrator at the time, Chris Carlson, came in for two days to evaluate us and we had to provide artifacts. So it couldn't just be like, oh yeah, no, we're doing that. Um, we had to be able um, to show them through kind of documentation and meeting with a, a multiple of you know, family, students, staff working in the program. So it was, you know, in my 15 years in, in this career of clinical social work in school settings, it's the first time somebody's asked me to go through this process. It was a, it was a pretty meaningful experience for us. I think one of the most valuable pieces was the staff interviews where we asked staff about their impressions and their knowledge of all of the pieces and the fidelity with which they felt that we were performing those things as opposed to just the artifacts showing it. And, and the staff impressions, all of us across the board actually were far more critical of ourselves than what the actual facts showed and the actual artifacts were able to say, look, we are actually doing that and we're doing it actually a lot better than we even think that we are. And then I think um, the outcome of it is it launched us into this year with some really nice data-driven goals um, of where we want to grow, where we want to learn, where we want to further develop ourselves. Um, and so I think being in slightly different places in this process, it was interesting to come together to think about this talk and just to think about kind of the impact and moving forward and kind of how it affects all of us. Um, just thinking about the the dedicated time and reflection, the time that we got to really think about how our programs are structured, um, what do we need to move forward, and having that time built into our schedule and somebody kind of motivating us to go forward and think about it really specifically. Um, thinking about our program structure and the needs, the development of short-term and long-term action steps, like they were talking about really starting the year with some really concrete goals. And then um, just keeping being collaborative and consistently reviewing and um, thinking of it as kind of a working document that we're constantly thinking about this data and moving forward with the progress of the students, the families, and obviously the staff and teachers in the schools. Um, and as they were saying, thinking about a programmatic approach versus um, just like a person-dependent model. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Please you. Please come see us anytime. <laughs> we might. <laughs> I, I, I have a quick question. What, um, how did um, you end up partnering with this organization? Is that how did that come to you guys? So um, I've worked with Wadiko for the last 14 years. Originally, I started working with them in Boston, and then um, continued the partnership in Reading, where I worked. And so, um, in part because of this particular work mm -hmm. that they do, um, I think it really, again, works for the long haul, so that we are empowering our staff to continue to look as student populations change and grow, expand, um, you know, shift a little right of what we used to be doing, maybe shift a little left of what we used to be doing. It gives us a way to respond to the needs versus always saying, oh, we need to create a new program mm -hmm. or we need to add more of this. I think one of, you know, I've learned to trust the process um, through several iterations of working with them because my fear is always like, they're gonna come back and they're gonna ask for 500 new staff to do X, Y, and Z. <laughs> and without fail, every time they kind of look at what they're doing and realize by organizing their schedule and their existing resources and whatnot, they're able to tackle, like you said, you realize you're doing a lot more than you, you think you are and when you're doing it in a targeted way, you're um, using our resources a little bit more effectively. Yes, Mr. Hainer. Uh, this may be for you, it may be for Dr. But you mentioned that uh, we're one of four or five communities that are going to be uh, required to deal with a lot of out-of-district students in the future. Will that impact your programs? So there's a question about uh -huh. the ESSA legislation. Is that what you're referring yes. to? Yes. So we'll find out more um, what that exactly means. So it's a the federal um, law was signed in a year ago, I guess. So it takes effect in December, certain portions of it. Um, the state itself hasn't necessarily figured out exactly how that's going to play out and exactly who's going to have fiscal responsibilities, but things will shift um, between 
McKinney Vento, where students were originally covered under the Homeless um, you know, Education Act, um, students that were previously awaiting foster care will no longer be considered homeless and they will shift over to the label of foster care, which will have implications under this ESSA legislation. So we'll know more as we get closer to December. The reason I bring this up is that it could be burdensome on our budget and things of that nature and affect other programs. And I, I, I don't want it to diminish anything. I, I feel it's important that we meet our obligations, but at the same time, the idea of being one of four or five communities in the whole Commonwealth is Am I wrong in saying that? It affects the whole Commonwealth. It's right. just that in terms of the number of uh, group home beds, we have Concerned. more than as many other communities. The other question I have for you, it, the Millbrook, uh, the out of district placement, the numbers that you have there, does that r reflect all the services? Millbrook is um, a general education program, so I did not reflect them in this special okay. education okay. presentation. Uh, my concern is with with all the homes that we do have in town and the burden, my understanding from different, that that, that program may be in going down below the high school, uh, if, they, if, if it, did we staff it prob uh, properly? Am I, I wrong in that assumption? I think we're kind of far out on that decision making. I, I don't know we're, that we're at that stage. Well, right now the program is located in the uh, central school. Right. Yes. and. We have, it's a general ed program. Right. And where it will reside down the road is, uh, remains to be seen. But for this year, they will be there. But part but of, the, it, part of their, their charge is assessing. And some of those students, after the assessment, could become part of your program yeah. as well as general ed. Oh, correct. And correct, correct. I guess when I say expanding, the, the age group in some of the homes may, may be going down. And I'm just concerned that we have the proper staffing and not overburden the existing staffing we have. That's all. We will be real sensitive to that as, as we go forward, for sure. Thank you. Uh, yes, Tasha Sampi. Um, I have a couple, for, uh, a couple comments. Um, first, thank you very much for including the abbreviation for the start of your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> no, because we always hear these alphabet soup things. Oh, yeah. I never right. see them written out. And it's really helpful. And if parents are interested, they'll be able to get this on their website. And they can Just wondering how we could get more information on these programs, the different ones, and how well <coughs> they're meeting the children's needs. I don't know if this would be part of, will come out as part of the uh, coordinated program review, or? Um, I think you would see that. So when, as they mentioned, they've completed their program evaluation. Um, they got to that phase of it. So I think that's the kind of information will give us. One of the other products that we have asked teams to create is a handbook. Um, so that reflects when they talked about targeting the needs of students um, very specific to their programming. Um, I think we've kind of done the umbrella of, oh, they have emotional impairment. They've qualified under emotional impairment, which is the disability category um, under the DESE. However, you know, when they really started to look at the student's profile and looking at the evaluation results, the family history, the outside survey, like really getting a much more nuanced picture of what students um, present with. And so part of their evaluation or part of the logic model really calls for them to, to do that on a, a very specific level. So, you know, saying that our students have anxiety and complex trauma history, you know, this is kind of how we've said students with um, autism spectrum disorders and those with social cognition and pragmatic needs, because maybe they don't have the, you know, disability category of autism, but they do have social and pragmatic needs. So they've really kind of distilled the profile of the student they're servicing. And once they've done that is when they start to then research what are the research-based interventions for these particular, you know, um, profiles and needs. So those exist to a degree in their handbooks. Um, I'm wary of putting, um, really hard <laughs> defined borders on some of this stuff because we do need to make sure that we're being individualized and we, and we can't restrict someone just because they don't necessarily fit all of the criteria and whatnot. So, um, you know, we have kind of larger overarching uh, descriptors of the programs uh, on the website. 
I guess what I'm thinking is just how well are our programs meeting our children's needs? That That's kind of the part that I'm really curious about. I guess I, I, I guess you'd have to define needs. So I, I think there's many indicators we look at, and one of the things that they develop in the program models is, you know, what are going to be our indicators? You know, simply saying are they meeting grade level expectation may provide one type of indicator, but they're not necessarily, that doesn't, you know, address the host of other issues, say, that a student with social cognition meet, uh, has because, you know what, they're also looking at how are they engaging in relationships with their peers and adults and some of that stuff is qualitative, but we're trying to look to make it more quantitative and that's part of the work that they're doing. So I don't have an answer specifically of we're meeting needs, yes, <laughs> we're meeting needs, no. I think it's a little more nuanced than just a yes or a no. So if you had specific questions, maybe they can, answer it I guess I'm having a hard time does it sound like um, I, I know that there are some documentation that you're 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 getting it is one of the questions is there something that we will see later on yeah you know kind that of. that sort of a summary of some of the documentation that you're doing from this process and others sure we can maybe that's that. yeah okay yeah, uh, okay. yeah, yeah. Want, sorry yeah and then one other thing I'm just trying to put in everyone's heads that as we go forward with rolling the Gibbs out as the new sixth grade only school, um, I am still concerned that the special education department was the ones who felt the most strongly that it wasn't a good idea um, and that there is concern about transition and I'm not sure if there were concerns beyond that, but I would love you to be thinking and helping us understand what can we do to make it the best possible experience for your students, not just for the general education students. Um, and um, I'm thinking specifically of transitions as school students come from elementary to Gibbs and then from Gibbs to Audison. How can we make that better for them? And is it, you know, is there things that we need to be building into the space? Is there, or, or anywhere you know is, is it additional equipment that we need or do we need to think about moving people transitioning people along with a class you know so they're basically rolling up with the class um i just i'd like us to have that as part as we start the gibbs process that we have we always have that idea in mind so mr carden uh, thank you, and, and congratulations on the team. I hear a lot. I, I'm a, da a Dallin parent, so I hear a lot of good things about the Dallin team uh, and everything that's going on there with the uh, SLC program there. Um, I, I think what maybe what Kiersey was looking at is um, it, it sounds like this, this evaluation process is coming up with some things that maybe you might need to do a little bit differently or things, you know, recommendations for improvements or things like that. If we could just get a summary of sort of what's been recommended and what's been implemented or things like that, not at a detailed level, but. Sure, so I mean, some of the things are, well, they've already talked about. So in the first iteration of the um, logic model, they identified that staff need to be trained prior to the start of the school year. So then they created a summer orientation program. Right. So those are the kind of yep. things yep. that um, but come out of it. the other programs, you know, maybe just keep a running yep. summary of that kind of stuff. Sure. That would be very helpful. Thanks. Um, uh, and then the only other, just more general comment is, it's actually the same same idea there was the staff training the only thing that I've been hearing from from parents is there are some new team chairs that have never had that role before and there's a little bit of a rocky start of the school year so let's just make sure that they're supported Mr. Thielman. Your coordinators are right over there do you hear that guys <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, I think the sixth grade issue was that there was it, it, it but just having one grade, it made it more difficult to follow a student throughout the three years. You know, you could, it was, might be more difficult, more challenging to develop a relationship with a student who uh, in, was in school for just one year in the sixth grade if they were on an IEP. That was maybe the concern we heard from some people. Um, specifically, I think some parents, I don't know if they're the same well, ones who have spoken concern. to you, okay. so have spoken to me about this idea of, yeah. you know, have you ever considered having the staff kind of loop so that, yeah. you know, they're not meeting new staff when they get then to the 7-8 program at Audison. Um, you know, I haven't run that by the teachers. I, I think they might have some thoughts about, you know, their own um, relationships with adults and whatnot and the team that they develop yeah. at the sixth grade level or at any grade level. I mean, Jason could probably, you know, speak to, you know, the, the teams that develop um, 
at the different grade levels and within the clusters. Mm. Yeah. Mr. Lee? I just found over the years continuity of the teams being together for several years it builds a better relationship and it's better for the students mm -hmm. and I just feel that it's really great to have the same teams for several years mm -hmm. instead of changing every single year because that puts more time for teachers where we have to have more meetings and try to gel together when we've already had a previous mm -hmm. relationship and work well together yeah well, I mean, I just as the sixth grade model is evolving, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess the point I want to make is just keep us informed of mm -hmm. how the special education program yep. is going to be developed. And, mm -hmm. yes. So yes, I, I'm going yeah, to Kathy yeah. because we yeah. So that, that's, and at some point, I think yeah, that. at some point we should we should sort of get a report on the sixth grade mm -hmm. plan. Yeah. The other thing, you know, a question that that, that um, town leadership often asks is, you know, uh, is the percentage or the number of students on IEPs increasing or decreasing over time? Um, I yeah, didn't least, prepare that. that yeah, I know, you, um, I know you didn't. That's I, kind of I, a, my understanding is, I mean, at least since I've been here, it's relatively consistent. The, yeah. um, you know, the number, the overall number hasn't actually creeped up as much as the population itself has creeped up, <laughs> I don't think. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we could get that for no. you. I mean, I, it, it's a question that, trend, that often, yeah. at budget time, when we visit the other <laughs> side of the street. Yeah. <laughs> There's a question about that. I can tell you that in the last four years at Dallin, we have um, graduated children to less restrictive settings every single year, which Good. has been something we've really enjoyed celebrating. Good for you. Great. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. I have a big picture question. Uh, where do you see special education Arlington going in the next five years? Or ten years, That's or whatever. That's a very big picture question. Yeah, big, big. Um, I mean, I think we're investing in our programs, but uh, Thad and I were just talking this morning. Um, where I really think special education needs to go, and Laura and I have had these conversations, is really working with general ed because you don't change special ed by changing special ed. <laughs> you change special ed by addressing general ed. So I would really like to see us looking at multi-tiered systems of support and looking at what, what we're doing in tier one with the, those foundational things that all students are getting so that when we are targeting kids at the you know, second and third tiers of support that you know, it really is targeted. Um, and that we last year we asked for um, additional learning specialists so we could expand co-teaching. I think you know, that is another way to address some of this gen eds and special ed support is by these co-teaching partnerships and co-teaching can take different forms. You know, it can be two teachers in a room all day, changing roles, you know, you're doing this session, this, and there's different ways to do it. And so I think, you know, with the addition of staff that, so that we could develop those relationships truly, um, you know, that's where I would like to see us going. Um, I'd like us to, keep us kids in district. <laughs> um, I would like to see that, you know, we have the capacity, you know, we've talked about um, the programs are really strong, but they're also, they have capacity issues. There's, uh, you know, there's finite space for programs, but then there's also, you know, what staff can do with the resources mm -hmm. they have, so. Um, okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, we have the very much. buffer zone. Do we have, Thanks oh yeah. Representative report. Hi. Hi. All right. Two. All right. Bye, Mr. Re Remy. Remy. Yes. Hi. Mike, Mike Remy. You've, you've met um, Mr. Remy before. Um, he is one of our two data specialists and. Well, they work very collaboratively together. He, he inherits a lot of the registration. And, um, you know, we have, just make a few comments before you begin, that, you know, we, we've really evolved in how we're doing registration in the district, in part by necessity of having buffer zones, in part by just the increasing number of students and needing to be very careful with resources. So the need to be really on top of enrollment numbers during the summer is key uh, to that. And um, he has led us through uh, some new software and you know, some new processes. And we've really had gone through just really the first year, the full implementation the first year. And we learned some things and probably will make some changes as we go forward. 
So tonight, um, he is going to give you an overview of buffer zones, which um, is, is a fairly frequent conversation over the summer for us. And it actually goes on all year, really. Yeah. So. Uh, so, uh, thanks for having me. Um, just wanted to start off by recapping some of the uh, data really briefly from last year um, to get a quick sense of where it's gone from then versus the system we have now. Uh, in the 14-15 registration cycle, I'm sorry, the 15-16 registration cycle, uh, we had 114 of our applicants in the buffer zone and we went over last year how many of them got their assigned, their preferred assigned school, how many of those were in kindergarten, and how many of those were in grades one through five. Mm -hmm. And looking at the numbers for 16, 17, as you all I'm sure are aware of, uh, enrollment has increased throughout the district um, all around. Same with our buffer zones, has gone up to 134 of the applicants being in buffer zones. Um, we do still have the policy in place that uh, siblings are kept together um, to preserve the family integrity. So of the 134 in buffer zones, 28 of those had siblings already at the elementary school, so they were guaranteed their placement. Uh, one interesting thing that we did this time around versus past years is have a, a window of time uh, for early applicants. Um, launching the online software meant that people were able to complete the applications from their homes as soon as the application went live. Um, and for the first week, we were uh, doing our best to make sure that those who completed the application early were getting um, that preference in early and would get better consideration for the uh, school of their preference in the buffer zone. Uh, so we had 57 of those uh, early applications were in buffer zones. On the first day, we had well over 100 applications come in. 57 of those were in buffer zones. And of those 57, 55 of them were kindergarten students. So just to kind of make sure that number stayed uh, represented, um, 39 uh, students overall were in K, uh, in, I'm sorry, in the first through fifth grade. And 95 total uh, students were in kindergarten outside of just those who were uh, early applicants. Uh, so the breakdown is that 91.5% of those kindergartens, kindergarten students did get their preferred school, whether that was because they had a sibling already in the school, they had their applications in early, or they just lucked out and got their preference as we went through and made those selections. Um, but I think that's uh, an extremely high percentage and you know it, it worked out and did exactly what we wanted it to do. Um, for grades one through five, a little different, 69%, uh, but from last year, that's slightly down from 75%, but considering the higher percentage of kindergarten students, once they're in that school, they'll stay in that school and they'll be you know, less to worry about. And overall, 85% of the students were assigned to their preferred school from the 68.4% last year. And I do think having uh, the early application window had a lot to do with that. And we're gonna talk and see about tweaking the model and um, finding how we can make it work a little better uh, for all families involved and in, uh, equal throughout the grade levels. Uh, getting through this last slide, and I apologize, this looks bigger on a computer monitor. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's really quick, it's just a breakdown of where those students in buffer zones ended up. Um, so you see across the top, all our elementary schools are represented, and which buffer zones uh, those 134 students were in, and you can see a distribution um, going straight across of those who were in the bishop bracket zone, how many of them ended up in bishop, how many ended up in bracket, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is a plethora of data gathered um, through the software uh, from this last registration cycle, and starting in a few weeks, we'll be starting to 
revisit those conversations and make adjustments for the for the 16. I'm sorry, the 17, 18 application, um, and see where we can improve and make things better. But a lot of this is available upon request. So if there are any, if there's anything that was left out of here, uh, please let me know, and we can um, start to put something together for you to kind of dig deeper into uh, the buffer zone report. Yes, Mr. Sleepin. Oh, I love this stuff. This is fascinating. <laughs> um, my question is with regard to the last uh, slide. Sure. Um, is that you're showing where kids ended up. I mean, I'd like to see which of these kids are the ones who ended up in their second choice and where they wanted to go. Because that's sort of a pattern that interests us as a policy perspective. Gotcha. Not, not just where they ended up, but where they asked to go and to compare those two. And that is, uh, all those metrics are gathered. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to just hit you with all kinds of graphs and charts and everything, um, but uh, give me a little time and I can put that together. I you. love graphs and charts. <laughs> sure uh, that, that's sort of my. Uh, He's the only uh, one that yeah. does. <laughs> oh, no, I love graphs. <laughs> You're not alone. Uh, Dr. Allison Amphi. It's probably good you didn't give them now because Mr. Schlickman would be drooling over here. Um, <laughs> In the meantime, I also had some questions. I went back and reviewed what, this is actually more for Dr. Bodie to be worked out with you. Um, I looked at our buffer zone policy, um, JC, and it talks about a report and it describes the report will be include but not be limited to a description of buffer use, open enrollment and their effectiveness. It should answer questions like, are the desired results be being achieved? And so is this attributable to the buffer zone and open enrollment policy or other factors? Is class size equity, imp uh, class equity improving? Are imbalances smaller? What buffers are being activated by how much and where's the flow between districts? And I think we've got some answers for the last one, mm -hmm. but I'd like to hear some of the stuff about how class size equity is doing. I mean, and we could just yep. add some of I've, these things. Um, it's partly it's helpful to the public. We mm -hmm. still have parents who are not as happy as they could be because they've been put in a buffer zone as opposed to a hard line um, right. boundary. And it's helpful to have things to point at that you know we're doing this because it's good for the school. It's it's good for the schools. It's good for the students. And here's why. And here are numbers showing that it's why. So. Right. Well, I had mentioned this, I think, um, probably one of the earlier meetings, that um, it really was quite effective this year, particularly at the kindergarten level. And that's interesting given what high percentage of the number of students they had their first choice. Partly it was luck this summer that we had sort of growth in all the districts, uh, you know, that, that part played out. But we were able to tweak it enough as we were going along that we really, we got down to the point where almost all of our kindergartens, at least at the start of the school, that can change as the year goes on and it already has. But, um, you know, the range was even narrower before, but, it, you know, we have a lot of, um, of classes, they're in the 20s, in the low 20s. And they were even within, I think, two or three at one point. But, what happens is some students leave, other students come in. In general, I, I would say that it has been very helpful to class sizes. If you recall, even not too many years ago, we would see some classes at one school at 28, mm -hmm. 31s, but in the high 20s, and other schools would have 20 in the same grade. And there was just that sense of there was an inequity of um, opportunity if you think that there is a value in, in s smaller classes, which I think there's a sort of a uh, unanimous agreement on that. So to the extent that we are able to have, um, it's sort of, it's not perfect at all, but we're certainly being able to see a, a little bit closer evenness um, here. And I think actually one of the reasons why the percentage is lower at first choice for grades one through five is attributable to exactly this. 
that you know what happens is as you have students in a particular grade students move students come in so that so there's a natural unbalancing that goes on so what buffer zones do a little bit is rebalance it and you'll see more of that rebalancing going on in the upper elementary grades than you would see it in the lower so I know that one of the questions that the committee is um, thinking about and I think we need some more thought about it and um, is whether it would be advantageous to have bigger buffer zones in certain districts or maybe in general uh, across the district. And I think that um, it, it, it may be too early to make that decision. We might need another year of data on that. But I can say that to the extent that the work this year, and we work very closely together, it was just a constant communication about this, that I, I think we achieved the best results we could with some real, you know, trying to at the same time um, give parents their preferred school. What is interesting, though, is that even toward the end of the summer, when we'd go back to wait lists, because we had this all organized by date and so forth, when when it changed because students do move, that um, we would go back and ask parents if they would like to go back to their preferred school and. We didn't do that too many, as many times this summer as we did the summer before, and it was sort of mixed. Some did, some didn't. And then we'd go down to the next person on the list. So I don't know if you have any other further questions on that, but all in all, I think it was uh, done well this year and achieved the goals we wanted to achieve. I, I think it would be helpful if we had some numbers that would back that up, um, and that that's what Maybe I'm standard deviation. About, in, in How, a, what difference well, is? In a, in a written report, and not yeah. just a presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Mr. Hainer. I'm the other end of the spectrum from Mr. Schlickman. So <laughs> if you could go to the third slide for me. About halfway down, Hardy Thompson, and it has 14 under Hardy Elementary. Does that mean there are? Can you explain that 14? What it means to me? Okay. So in the Hardy Thompson zone, right. uh, 14 of them were assigned to Hardy with okay. the other seven assigned to Thompson. There were 21 uh, applicants total that were in that zone. So if we go all the way down to the bottom, the Thompson Hardy, that would mean nine Thompson went to Hardy and eight went to Thompson yeah. on the last line? Yeah. Correct. Okay. Uh, I guess this, my next question goes to you, Dr. Bodie. Sometimes the numbers are almost even. Is it when they come in that they're assigned? Or, I mean, the purpose it's, of this was to try to bring balance to the schools and stuff. And, and I know it's a um, difficult game to play with the numbers and stuff, but. The answer is yes, it is by numbers. And in fact, um, Remy was talking about that window. So that window is too wide. And I think that one of the things one of the things that we're going to do this year is actually have the online start the same day as walk-in and, and date stamp everything by day again. Because it was a little difficult, uh, I have to say, when you had so many that all had the same, because um, we don't differentiate time of the day, only the date. So yes, but then beyond that, everything became very ordered in terms of the date. So I think that would, um, it's going to be one change that we're going to have this year. Thank you. We Mr. had Sutton. no idea it was going to be so successful, the online process, so yeah. now we can tweak. Mr. Slickman. Yeah, I mean, the, the, thing, the thing that for us, I, I have no doubt that it went well and that our policy was executed well and that y'all did everything you could to make people happy. Uh, I, I really have faith in, in the operations of the district. But part of this is a policy question. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we're asking for this report is not to check up on the operations, because that's your job to make sure it goes well. And we have faith that it is going well. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're looking for, in essence, is uh, sort of a sense, is our policy right? How's the policy working? What do we need to do to adjust the policy in order to make things better for parents? I mean, if you've got a whole bunch of people clumping up on the first date, it's almost like 
you, know, you, you don't want people fighting to be in at 90101 versus 90103. No. Uh, maybe for within the early process, the people who are first in within a two-week window, we could go by lottery in terms of the order of assignment. Uh, something that's up front and, and fair that's not encouraging people to... Um, to, to have to take a day off from work or to be here at a precise time in order to get the best shot of making a lottery deal. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there are lots of questions that are policy questions. How do we make this work better? Do we expand the zones? Where do we expand the zones? We, yeah. uh, and, and that really is our domain mm -hmm. in terms of setting the policy because we have to go to the community, explain it, face it, get consensus, and come back and vote it. So. I, I think that in terms of uh, of a future report in writing, you know, we had all these little zones when we set it up in 2012. The new members weren't here for all the decision of zone A or buffer zone A, buffer zone C. What was the H was the one that was the, 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 the interesting one for us. Where they are within those zones, where, where the kids are being assigned and maybe going, uh, encountering difficulties within the sort and, and maybe where, where we might want to go and tweak the boundaries, especially considering the development that's taking place in the town. Right. Well, I, don't, I think the policy is working fine. Mm -hmm. um, I, given the success this year of trying to keep it fairly even, I, I, I couldn't really recommend that you change any of the boundaries yet. Now, this I may have a different he said something different next year, but right now I, I wouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. The process is um, basically doesn't really get into the nitty gritty of the process, but mm -hmm. that we don't want to time stamp. And in fact, that's why we did the online process last year early because mm -hmm. we didn't know really how many people would take to online. Well, there's oh. also the question of um, availability and access, uh, mm -hmm. if the server could handle uh, mm -hmm. certain loads of mm -hmm. traffic. Um, so just, we didn't want to make it feel like getting in line for concert tickets or getting your new iPhone where yeah. you gotta keep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we did have a, a pretty long window uh, and then seeing how well it worked, we're gonna make some uh, changes for the upcoming year. And uh, just as, a, as an aside, something that I am looking into moving forward, and we've uh, spoken about this as well, is not just what happens once someone applies mm -hmm. and gets into the schools, but as they move around post-registration. Uh, we'll have a number of students who may be renting uh, mm -hmm. in one area, mm -hmm. but then mm -hmm. buy a home mm -hmm. in a buffer zone, well, now what happens? Mm -hmm. And you know, who are we following up with where that student is versus mm -hmm. just leaving them in the school where they were? Should they be mm -hmm. uh, adhering to the buffer zone standards at that point? Mm -hmm. Just kind of figuring those things out. So we'll be keeping a closer eye on those kind of things and uh, seeing how folks move around throughout the district uh, going forward. Yeah, I, I work closely with a person who does control choice in Lowell and I know the headaches that he can get uh, from a variety of things and in, in, in we put you in a stressful job because anytime you're dealing with a parent where we've got some authority to go and move a child in a buffer zone to an assignment they don't want, that's likely to be an unpopular thing and you're the face of our district in this. And we want to have your back through, through the whole process and make the systems work so even if the parent gets assigned to their second choice school, that they're feeling good about it and feeling good about the process they went through. And, and I know that your skills are gonna be there, but I want our policy to align with uh, your opportunity to do this as well as possible. Yeah, and I, I do feel um, it might not be what folks wanna hear, mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, we do have curriculum directors working very hard to make sure all the schools are at the same level. Mm -hmm. So whether you're at Hardy or Thompson, mm -hmm. you know, you're getting the same quality mm -hmm of education, so, mm -hmm. you know, if it keeps the classroom sizes down, yeah. let mm -hmm. that be the focus and not just, right. you know, mm -hmm. a building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think something Mr. Remy mentioned, uh, and we've also talked about, is that we might want to look at in terms of policy, is what happens when a student moves. And I, I don't think we actually have 
potentially clear-cut policies about mm -hmm. that. There's a yeah. tradition, but maybe not as clear-cut policies. Right. Um, uh, Mr. Cardin. Sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks. So uh, three things. I'll try to be quick. Um, so there was a perception in the community that there was a race to file this year. So I think we need to, our, mm -hmm. our policy says as long as they apply um, through early April and, and mm -hmm. you know, you can be flexible on those dates, that's supposed to be a window mm -hmm. where they have two, you know, a, a few weeks to apply. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to be very clear in the message that it doesn't matter within those two weeks mm -hmm. when you apply, mm -hmm. you, everybody goes in together. So uh, we don't want that race that, that mm -hmm. Paul was talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, unless you want to change the policy, in which you can I come to policy for that. I don't think it's quite that way. It was it was really an ordered process, and before it would it, would, it was that we did it on people would yeah, come were, in. Excuse me. There were people online saying, "I'm trying to register. I can't get in the system. I have to register today because I'm in a buffer zone." Mm -hmm. So it, it did. I'm happen. sure that perception was. I'm, I don't doubt that perception was there. We tried to make it really clear when we sent out the communications. In fact, multiple communications that mm -hmm. anybody that registered in that week plus came in that day all had the same equal date. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't, I will yeah, well, we'll continue to the, message the, that. I looked, it wasn't on the website at that time. Yeah. So let's just make sure we do it this year. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing to bring up is, you know, one of the issues with the policy was when the, buff, when the, when the redistricting commission was thinking about this, was neighborhood cohesion. So one of, the, one of the trends I see here in East Arlington is sort of this, it's sort of becoming this choice area where you've got uh, you know, nine people in the Thompson-Hardy district choosing to go to Hardy and 14 people in what used to be the Hardy district choosing to go to Thompson. I mean, not seven people in the Hardy district choosing to go to Thompson. Mm -hmm. That really wasn't what was you know, intended for it and that's sort of what's happening. That's just a sort of an interesting thing to look at and, and think about as you know, we evaluate this policy holistically. Yes, it's meeting our needs, but is it is it worsening this neighborhood cohesion where kids are all going to different elementary schools? Maybe that's not a bad thing. I don't know, but it's sort of an interesting trend that I saw mm -hmm. in the data. Mm -hmm. And then the other, no. oh, go ahead. No, I, I think it's um, also important to keep in mind that uh, part of this, uh, what we're seeing here, also represents students who had siblings already at that school. So it won't, and it's not going to answer that 100%, mm -hmm. but there's also part of that that, you know, just says defaultly, yeah. you have an older brother, older sister already at Thompson, you're going to Thompson. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other issue, which is already coming up for, for this year, is the after school programs. And people in the buffer zones don't know what they're supposed to do about applying to after school programs. So I think we need to be, make it clear to those programs that they should not be enrolling people or put, giving them preference on wait lists until buffer zone assignments are made. And that, and that message was given to all of the after school programs, whether they were our programs or Great. private, that they could not make any decisions about that until the buffer zones, and, and I think they all adhered to that. Mm -hmm. Maybe not? Not what I'm hearing, but. Not um, what you're hearing, I mean, well, it, it, may, it was it, clearly asked yeah. of all of them um, that that would be what we wanted to see. Great. But we will check up on that a little bit better than sh this year. Great, thank you. Um, I was very impressed by the, how equitable the numbers are were this mm -hmm. year. I mean, we had kindergarten classes between 22 and 24 mm -hmm. across. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I think will be interesting for us is that different schools have different retention rates because some areas of town have a lot more rentals and then others, mm -hmm. and to see whether those equitable class sizes now continue to be equitable um, will be interesting for us to, to know. Yeah, Mr. Hainer. Just real quick, is there any thought of ever asking parents if they'd be willing to go to another school when they're in the buffer zone, or do you just assign? Oh, you mean outside the? If they're not in the buffer zone. If they're not in the buffer no, zone? No, no. I mean, Buffer zone sometimes can be a little contentious because my neighbors, they're friends and stuff, and you're going to one school and I'm going to another school. I didn't know if, the, if that's ever offered. I mean, it, it throws another thing into the mix. Um, where that comes in is there's another process, open enrollment. Okay. And uh, yes, that does happen. And, and some the most common reason for why people want to do that is that a grandparent or a babysitter is nearby. Mm -hmm and it's easier walking. Um, so we deal with that that way. Now, I will say that in the policy, 
and, and we, we, we actually adhere to it very um, consistently, all buffer zone decisions are made first, because that was a promise we made, and then we go to open enrollment. So open enrollment decisions, we, we tell people, aren't really made until the summer. Some are more clear you can do it earlier in the summer, but some have to even wait as long as the end of July. Two word facts. Thank you. And keeping in mind that it's 100% a moving target, um, what happened a lot with so many applications coming in very early online is as we went through the summer, oh, as it turns out, I was applying for Arlington, but we ended up moving in late July, or this and that happened, so more space started to fill out, and by the time school started, uh, my projections for class sizes and then the actual class sizes changed quite a bit, and you know things kind of freed up, um, which worked out, but you know from what we were looking at, what mid July, late July versus you know first week of September there's a, a bit of fluctuation with those who don't actually attend even though they've completed all the paperwork and applications. Mm -hmm. Moving targets a good way of describing it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Mm -hmm. It's a very dynamic process and just the nature of it being dynamic is gonna put, a, a, it's not gonna be perfect and you'll never get perfect results because as soon as you've balanced a class you can have a move and it changes and, mm -hmm. but um, I think it, was effective and uh, I want to appreciate, you know, publicly appreciate all the work Remy did because it was a lot, mm -hmm. especially when you go through developing a, a new system. Uh, that there was a heavy, heavy workload last year on this one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. can, actually, can I ask Dr. Ray a question, um, which is not actually related to buffer zones, but when we were given the recent uh, monthly reports, um, so compared to mid September, some schools seem to have. Uh, had bigger changes than others, and I was mm -hmm. wondering if that was actual kids moving out of those schools, or if that was us catching up and uh, administratively knowing that kids had moved out. More of the latter. So okay. what, ha what often happens, this is something I again want to maybe repeatedly message out this year, sometimes parents just forget when they move that they should tell the school system. Mm -hmm. So what happens in, in the fall is that we have students on a class list and basically you know we're balancing this based on this but then the school year starts and the student doesn't show up and then that's when we do some uh, some calling that happens at the school level and I think you've done some of that as well yeah, yeah. Uh, the per the ESC we have to there's a, a 15 day wait um, to make sure that okay, great, you're not here the first week. Is the family just on vacation and hasn't come back yet? Or are you truant or are you not actually here and just missed. forgot to tell us? So we don't want to go ahead and say, all right, you missed three days. Let's give up that spot and see if somebody else wanted to be in that classroom and start rebalancing again. Um, so to be fair and adhere to that policy, we have to wait and wait and wait and then follow up with our um, attendance uh, deputy and She'll go out, we'll make the calls, I'll send her some list and follow up with those families and oh, yes, yes, we did actually mm -hmm. yes. choose this school and that and then. I think what was noticeable to me is that it was actually three schools were a higher percentage than others and so the question is are there procedures that we can implement in those schools that maybe other schools mm -hmm. with less variation are doing that we could look at see what, what, what the successful schools who have less variation are doing and whether that can, same thing can be done at the schools with a higher variation. We can try, it's tough to say, yeah. um, as there's also the consideration of the METCO program and you know students coming into there. Mm -hmm. um, we can definitely <coughs> look into lots of things. You know, we're for the 17-18 process, um, we're welcome to make all kinds of tweaks. Um, one of the bigger ones being with the uh, preschool is going to get the same kind of treatment so we can do better mm -hmm. analytics for that as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we can keep making this better. Mm -hmm. uh, Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having Thank you. And uh, love charts. <laughs> keep them coming. <laughs> he loves Char charts, too. <laughs> keep them coming. <laughs> I think many of us like charts, <laughs> but not all. Well, then this is your <laughs> presentation coming up. <laughs> now on. Yes. Okay. Yes, the charts. <laughs>
by Dr. Chesson of the Park uh, Report. Okay. So um, before I start, I want to um, share two things. First of all, um, as I think we talked about the last time with accountability, the state gave us the results based on park, um, based on five levels, and in the previous years we've used four levels. So at the time that we met the last time, we were in the process of translating um, the four, five levels into four levels. So the committee got the um, first draft of the report um, when we had not finished six, seven, and eight, but I wanted to give you as much as we had. And today you have a hard copy in front of you that has the translations for six, seven, eight. So if you notice differences, and I'm gonna try to actually point out as much as possible where that's happening so you can see um, why that becomes important. Um, and also, um, when we get to the elementary charts, I'm gonna give you, try to give you some indication of how well park levels four and five, in some cases, map to proficient in advance, and in some cases, let park levels four and five do not map to proficient in advance. Sometimes they take a little bit more of three up, and sometimes they take a little bit of four down. Um, but overall, we really saw results remain fairly stable despite the new test. So uh, I think everybody went into it um, knowing that they were good testing the test and with as little stress as possible, and yet we got pretty good results considering that that was the approach that we took. So we're gonna start with English language arts. Um, this is our student growth percentile by grade for English language arts. Um, as you know, our target is 50. You'll notice I'm, um, a, I'm now putting a postscript on the bottom, and that is that um, depending on whether you talk to the the DSAC people at the Department of Education or you talk to the people at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, um, the margin of error in a, um, a uh, student growth percentile can be anywhere from 20 to 30 points. Yeah, so it has a helpful. very large margin of error. So I just wanna call that to your attention. So, Excuse me, where's the validity of the, the report then? Uh, Not, so knocking you, yeah. <laughs> Question. This is definitely I mean, a case I, of don't shoot the messenger, Mr. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm <laughs> right, but on, I mean, on the results. You, you look at grade seven, and if you got a, they yeah. did great. <clears throat> if you got a 30 point. I'm, well, if there's a 30 point discrepancy. Right. So we, we, we're saying the 50 is our target. We are shooting for 50. If I see a 46, I'm not gonna, or 49, I'm certainly not gonna panic. If I see a 28, then I'm gonna ask more questions because of the, the, the large amount of, of uh, but if, if I'm the teacher you're asking that question to, and I look at your footnote, mm. I am asking you why you're asking me the question. I'm not trying to be contentious right. with you. I mean, that's the state's issue. Right. Uh, Dr. Allison, if he has something. Is, okay. is the margin of error this big this year because of the conversion, no, it's, or is it's it always? always big. It's it's all, it, it's, from the people that I've talked to, it's always been that large. So it, it must be even bigger, though, this year because of Mr. Schlickman Parkinson. has an answer. Yeah, Mr. Schlickman <laughs> can keep the, it simple. No, the, an, the answer really is no. Um, there, there, is, uh, there, there is inherent error in individual scores, so you shouldn't view an individual score as being discrepant o over the, the course of 20 or 30 points. I mean, I, I'd say that I, I'd be looking at closer to 10 to 15 for an individual kid on a case-by-case -case basis. However, uh, what we're looking here is median scores, so you're looking at a distribution of median scores, which is actually remarkably quite tight, so that a score below 40 or above 60 is considered to be extreme. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Just ignoring. <coughs> Uh, ignorance of this if that margin of error mm -hmm. are you saying that margin of, where does that 20 to 30 apply well, in what you're actually, saying let's, I, I, let's, let's actually go, go on, on and we'll right. we can take that offline uh, uh, yeah, you don't, yeah. don't want to get into yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> However, okay. it, it's just just think of it this way that if you go and ask three people how they're voting in the presidential election yeah uh, you're, you're likely not to have a, a large enough sample. If you have, uh, if you ask 300, 500, or 1,000, depending on the variance of the uh, sampled population, you're going you're to hit it uh, <coughs> tightly. And, and if, if you take a look at what 538.com does, is they're doing repeated sampling and by uh, virtual wait, 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 wait. Yeah, let's, let's go on, let's go on, I think. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're going to We were doing so well on this. <laughs> All that all the error in individual kids washes out when you group more kids yep. together. Right. Okay. 
Okay, so for English language arts, we, we, you, you have a new chart here that you haven't seen before because of the translations that we were doing. So this is grade three, English language arts, and it looks at the scores from 2014 to 2016. So the light blue um, is the 2014 percent of proficient and advanced. Um, the darker blue is the tw 2015 percent of proficient and advanced. The white score is the park percentage for levels four and five. The black score, the black bar is when you take the white, the, the level four and five scores and you translate them into proficient and advanced. Okay. I have a question. <laughs> yeah. The state tells us, yeah. okay, based on what their park score is, whether that translates to an MCAS proficient, advanced, needs improvement, or... So in some cases, the different schools have the same, similar numbers for the white bar, but different numbers for the black bar. Yeah. So that reason that would happen is, say, at Bishop, when the white bar is lower than the black bar, in general, they took some of the students who scored at the top of the level three, I see. and they moved that up to so it's proficient a question and of advanced. who's at the top versus... So it depends on how many kids your school had there at the top, Got how it. it would fluctuate. Okay. Now, you're going to see some charts in, in a minute where the, they flip around, so that means that they took some kids at the bottom of four and put them down to needs improvement, and they weren't proficient and advanced. The big thing to note about this chart is, for example, for Bishop, in 2014, they had 75% of their students at grade three proficient and advanced. In 2015, they had 83%, and after we do the conversion in 2016, they had 86%. That's pretty much the same. It's only three percentage points. If I look at bracket, they had 89% in 2014, they had 83% in 2015, and they had 95% in 2016. That's, a, that's an increase. That, that number is significantly different than I would say that they had an increase in that year. <coughs> so if we look across the board, we can see that um, for the most part, schools either did slightly better or the same than they have done in previous years in grades three in ELA. And considering that this was number one, um, a, a brand new school, um, test and also at Bishop these kids were taking an online test at grade three for the first time I'm thinking that they look pretty good <laughs> uh, can you hit the next it doesn't want to see up oh, there we go I got it um, when we look at grade four ELA we see um, the same uh, bars that you saw before so again the bars you really want to look at are the light blue the dark blue and then the black. So if we look at um, Bishop, significant increase. Um, and that's the school that took it online. Um, if we look at uh, Bracket, if we look at um, uh, Dallin, you'll see that there's a slight decline. Hardy, Pierce stayed about the same. Thompson, again, a slight de a decline. And then Stratton, um, a significant increase. So it varies from school to school. And considering that the level of pre um, preparation was pretty much the same for most of the schools, um, I think that this just gives us you know, the range of results that we would have expected to get. Looking at our student growth percentile, again, the state did the translation to MCAS so they could create a student growth percentile. Um, and everybody is at close to 50 or above 50, which is our target. When we look at grade so five, yes. I'm sorry. Are we concerned though from the 15 to the 16 scores? Are we concerned? That's In other words, if you look at Thompson. Four. 15 and 16. Yep, grade four. When you say that our target is 50, I, and 48, I, I see less was of a 82.5 is an incredible amount of growth. Yeah, this oh, is. You're this right, but, and, and then. To, and then it kind of got to the median again. Okay, so, okay. Um, for whatever reason, that core cohort of students, you know, grew pretty significantly <clears throat> that year. Um, if we look at grade five, um, again, you're looking mostly at the light blue bar, the bright blue bar, and the um, black bar. That's the way that you want to take a look at that. Um, and you'll see, um, I don't know why I have no notes because I'm looking at the wrong copy of my presentation. Um, hold on one second. Um, in grade five, um, you'll see that what this shows with the white bar being lower than 
um, the black bar again is that some of the level threes were moved up to proficient and advanced. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, pretty much, this is more even. You see less dramatic change at grade five. And here's the SGPs, again, all above 50. Uh, this is a chart we've shown before. Um, the trouble with showing this chart this year is that the state did not release um, what their percentage of proficient or advanced is, and advanced is because of the self-selection of, of schools taking PARC or taking MCAS. So it's pretty hard to, um, so you cannot compare yourself against the uh, state. So the best we can do is look at the percentage of proficient and advanced over time. As you see at grade, um, so at grade six, uh, we were 87% proficient and advanced in ELA last year and we're 85% this year. Again, new test, that's pretty good. When we go on to grade seven, uh, it was about 85 or 80, I'm sorry, 88% proficient and advanced in ELA last year and we're 83% this year. Again, new test and they took it online. Um, the last one, this is what I wanted to show you this chart. This is what when we used the just the level fours and fives, which was the initial data that we got, we looked at this data and said, whoa, we have a real problem. But remember, this is before the conversion. And when we do the conversion on the next page, you see that we only go from 94 to 87%. So there was a 10-point difference from when we just looked at the fours and fives and when we did the conversion to proficient and advanced. So that demonstrates how that goes. So we'll move on to math. Again, this, you're gonna see the same bar charts for elementary that you saw in the past. Again, the light blue, <coughs> the bright blue, and the black are really what we wanna look at. Um, we see that um, because the white is lower than the black, that some of the level threes at the top were moved up to proficient and advanced. Um, and we see across the board, for the most part, some pretty good increases in each of the elementary schools, um, either staying the same or a slight increase from uh, last year to this year in terms of third grade math. If we look at fourth grade math, um, you'll see that this is one of the, the times where the white and the black bar for the most part are pretty close together, but you has diff this is where the schools are a little bit different and it depends on where the kids were in terms of proficient or advanced. Um, but some of the schools uh, showed an increase, um, some of the schools um, showed about the same and this was one of the um, results that we talked about that we were surprised at and this showed a decline, a pretty significant decline in Dallin. And um, we are, as I said the last time, looking at other data to try to um, get a handle on that. If we look at the SGPs, again, for grade four math, um, <coughs> you'll see that's why we're questioning Dallin. It's a pretty low SGP for this year. Um, and the same thing for, for Stratton. The rest of them are close to in the 40 to 60 range, which is, um, and I go by what my DSEC, former DSEC person, Paula O'Sullivan is our data person for the state. She used to work for DSEC, which is the d division in the state that um, works with schools that are uh, at the lowest levels to try to br bring them up. And she um, would tell me that even though our target is 50, that they really don't worry about anybody until they fall below 40. Um, and finally for grade five, um, Again, this is uh, somewhere where the, the level, some of the level threes were moved up to proficient and advanced. And similarly to um, what we saw in ELA, scores start to level out when we get to grade five. Um, and we see the same thing happening when we get to middle school, that there's a lot more diversity in scores at six, seven, and then when we get to eight, the kids start to level out again. And looking at the SGPs for grade five, um, again, we see a concern that we're investigating more at Dallin and Thompson, um, and the remaining schools are above 40. Looking at the middle school, again, we can't really compare ourselves at the state, but we see that our percent proficient and advanced in math at sixth grade remained the same from last year. Um, we did see some decline in grade seven, 
um, which is one of the reasons why we're going to start using iReady um, to try to get a better handle on um, where those students stand, which iReady is an, an assessment tool that we're, online assessment tool that we're piloting at the middle school. And if we look at the math for eighth grade, it's pretty much the same. Now, math for eighth grade is a little harder to discern because now we have two tests. Before, we used to have just one test. Everybody took the math test at grade eight. And now, in grade eight, um, uh, uh, the large percentage of our students take the algebra one test. And then the other students take the grade eight test. Um, and pretty much what you'd expect, students who take algebra one are generally students who do pretty well in math and their percentage proficient or advanced is higher than the students that take the, the regular eighth grade math class because those are students that tend to be a little more challenged in math. Um, so looking on to grade 10, um, in grade 10 the level of prof uh, proficient and advanced in math is just slightly down from last year. Um, but the state also went slightly down, so the difference between our, ourselves and the state is about the same. That's the only way we can compare because uh, MCAS is now the, still the same in 10th grade. So looking at science, now science remained the same. Um, everybody took MCAS, whether they were at grades 5, 8, or 10. Um, we see that we're still um, significantly better than the state at grade five in science, even the widening the gap this year compared to last year. Um, we saw a significant increase in the proficient and advanced scores at grade um, eight in science. And considering that we have two teachers that were recognized in science and technology as being the best in the country, I think mm -hmm. that we uh, definitely see a result of that. And uh, I'm sorry that the labels aren't on here, but we are pretty much stayed the same in our uh, percentage of proficient and advanced um, at science in grade 10. And you see that we still <coughs> have our difference from the state. We're pretty much staying the same. Last time there was a question about PPI. So I wanted to just um, answer Ms. Stark's question from the last time. Um, and Mr. Schlickman gave me a, a really nice way to explain this. So I'm, I'm going to take this one on the road. Um, so P this is PPI over time for the high school. There was a question the last time about weren't we concerned about how the PPI at the high school, the cumulative PPI, seemed to be going down. So I wanted to show you the PPI, um, which is an accountability measure for all students and high need students at the high school from 2013 to 2016. And you'll see that it pretty much has remained stable for all students um, with the exception of the 2014 school year. Um, and then it went up for 2014, 2015 for high needs group, but then it went back down. So I want to show you what that does with all students. So remember, 2013 is 71, 2014 is 104, 2015 is 71, and 2016 is 79. So this is a weighted average. So the second bullet line down there, you see, shows you how you would calculate it. So you would take your FY16 number, multiply it by four, your FY15 number, multiply it by three, your FY14 number, multiply it by two, and your FY13 number, you'd add, them, uh, add all those calculations up and divide by 10, and that would give you your cumulative weighted average for PPI. So what does that mean? Well, in 2016, we were taking the number 79 and multiplying it by four, the number 71 and multiplying it by three, that big number that you just saw, the 104 and multiplying it by 2, and then 71, and then adding that up and then dividing it by 10. In 2015, we were taking the 104 and multiplying it by 3. So that inflated that calculation, and the same thing would have happened for 2014. That would have then been multiplied by 4. So that's why even though the numbers are pretty much stable, because of the weighted average and the number of times you multiplied that one high year by what, whatever number, whether it be four, three, two, or one, is going to make that cumulative PPI look like it's shifting when in fact it's pretty much staying the same. Mm -hmm. so that was a you question. Define PPI for the public. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's made up of the scores you get for closing the achievement gap, uh, the scores you get for um, uh, gr student growth percentiles, the points you get for that, and you get bonus points if you take the uh, percentage of your students 
um, at advanced up more than 10%. Um, and you get bonus points if you take the percentage of your students down more than 10%. So that's a good question. It was almost like we planned it. <laughs> so if we look at our MCAS scores over time, if we look at what we can get bonus points for, the bonus points are, especially at the bottom level, are by to decrease the percentage of students at the failing level by 10%. Well, in 2016, we had 1% of our students. So the ability to do that is very, very small. And we have almost consistently had 70% of our students and above score at the advanced level. So to erase that by 10% is, is quite a bit. The same thing happens in math. You see that very small percentage. So when we look at this, it becomes more and more difficult as that percentage gets higher in order to get those bonus points. And when I looked back, many years it was because we did not the, the years that were in the 70s is because we did not get our bonus points. Mm. Um, and so I, I think that explains it. The other question that came up the last time was about the, the percentile ranking of the high school. And the question was why when we see other types of ranking, uh, US News and Report, mm -hmm. um, Boston Magazine, is the high school rated higher? Mm -hmm. Well, that's because they use a full picture. They don't just use one measure. So when those folks do their ratings, they use things like AP scores mm -hmm. and the percentage of students that take AP classes and the comparison between the results we get and the per pupil spending that we do. Right. There's like 12 or 13 Graduation factors rates. that they take into consideration. So when you take a fuller picture of the high school, that's why they come out. And this measure that we saw last time strictly goes by one measure, mm -hmm. and that's by this measure. Uh, Mr. Slipman? Yeah, there's very little. It, the, the challenge of high schools all over the state is there's very little differentiation in that uh, if you're taking the MCAS, a far greater percentage of students are scoring proficient and advanced on the high school test than there are in grades three through eight. And the measure that they're using to calculate your PPI is a an index that tops out at the lowest proficient score of 240. So basically, if you're proficient or above, you get 100 points. Mm -hmm. And so if you're moving kids way past that point, if you have a kid, lot of kids in the advanced category, it's not going to okay. boost your numbers. So th this gets kind of muddy. And uh, districts, uh, high performing districts, are disadvantaged in terms of the extra credit points. Mm -hmm. uh, for high school, we do get. Uh, better ratings because they also include uh, graduation rate, dropout, dropout retention, bonus points for bringing kids back in, uh, a couple of other factors. But it, it, it's, it's kind of muddy at the high school level. Um, I, I don't think that the, you know, 75 is the target under the system. We're not striving for 100. Everybody's striving to hit 75. And you're only going to hit 100 if you're hitting a bunch of extra credit points. So we, everybody should be smiling at 75, and 75 is a bit of a challenge always. So that's why you do see a lot of schools that fall like 72 or 73, and they get bumped down to, to level two. Mm. It, it's right in the, in the center of that distribution. So I'm never worried about a difference between level one or level two. And in, in the there's a lot of mud in the uh, high school percentile ranks, uh, and in fact. If you're, if you're thinking about the variance in this, and there's a lot more variance this year than before, is because you basically have three classes of, school this year, of schools this year um, in grades three through eight. One, you've got a <coughs> bunch of schools that switched to park in 2015, and it's their second year of park. Then you've got the schools that were a member of, which were at MCAS last year and moved to park this year mm -hmm. and then you've got and that's about a quarter of the schools statewide and then you've got a quarter of the schools statewide that stayed with MCAS so that of the uh, of the schools that are being rated within the system 75% took the test they took the year before and 25% didn't right. and we were in that didn't group and that's why we were held harmless mm -hmm. on accountability measures with regard to performance because if 25% of the schools are taking a different test in 2016 than in 2015, and the other 75% are taking the same test, chances are 
uh, the schools that switch tests this year would be disadvantaged. Uh, and that's going to show up in your scores. And of course, sometimes strange things happen. Um, uh, Lowell's growth measures on ELA went way up this year. And we were also a switch school. So maybe there's something we're doing aligns more to Park than to MCAS. I don't know. But we didn't have experience with Park. Arlington didn't have experience with Park. It was a new, new experience. And there was a lot of good teaching and learning, but not very much thinking about what the test is going to look like and prepping kids for tests, which is sort of uh, the standard anxiety-driven teaching technique that uh, precedes the, uh, the, the test. But the, the point I want to make, though, is that our scores were pretty much the same that yeah, they were yeah. the previous year mm -hmm. without a ton of test prep and without yep. a lot of anxiety. Maybe so test prep is actually not effective. <laughs> oh, I, I, th I think, I think it was know. a great environment yes. this year, and I really yes. th thought that the teachers in Arlington went, went at this in a very positive manner, and uh, my attitude towards looking at the results this year is, okay, that's nice, uh, Move on. and let, let's, let's just teach the children well and be done with this because I'm not worried about any of our schools. There's no warning signs. Uh, we're, we're a high performing district. Uh, we switch tests. That's nice. Uh, uh, go teach. Yeah. Mr. Thielman. So given the fact that there was less test prep than there have, have been, has been in the past, is that going to be the norm going forward? Well, you know, every teacher, as much as we work together as, yeah. as colleagues, also closes their door, you know, know, and so this year we told people that really were trying out the test and don't do a lot of test prep, and I think the vast majority of people um, listened and, and went with that. I think there were some people that didn't, and I think that that's always going to be the case. Um, I think that we, when we look at PARC, um, it's very aligned, and MCAS 2.0 appears to be going in the same direction, very aligned with the Common Core. That's what our writing and reading programs look like. That's what our math programs look like. Um, and I, it, clearly our students did not suffer um, from uh, not concentrating on test prep. So I would say we'll just keep a course. Thank yes, you. Mr. Rayner. I, and I, I don't know, with regard to test prep, I see test prep being how to take a test, how to use, if it's a new instrument, and things of that nature. I'd that be very, yeah, yeah. if that's where we are, that's great. I just want to make that clear. We're not teaching to the test that, that the test should be no. an evaluation of the curriculum. No. Because uh, the format has changed, how to do a test, lowering the anxiety of test taking, I think that's great. But I just want to make that clear to the public that we're I, not testing. I have to say that I feel historically Arlington does fairly well in lowering does. anxiety around test taking. Uh, that doesn't mean that every single teacher, you know, maybe new, doesn't create anxiety, new, but but I think test. that we do a pretty good job right. at not focusing overly on the right. tests. Um, Nobody's going to be able to prep for the test in 2017 because right. it'll be the first year of MCAS 2.0 and yeah. nobody knows what it is. Yeah. Even the state. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> maybe, you can just, maybe, just explain, maybe you can explain for people watching what test prep has entailed, but what, what, what is it? For um, yeah. Well, it depends. There's everything from um, practicing the released questions. Mm -hmm. um, it, so the, this is spectrum, so on a continuum. So there may be a teacher who makes the choice that they're going to review every released question with their students, and they're going to focus on now see you try that, oh, no, 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 this is how you answer that kind of question. Here's how you know it's that kind of question. So very similar to if you've ever had a student that takes the SAT prep class. Um, all the way to um, the other end of the spectrum, me, you know, just give it a try. Here's what the questions look like. This is the keys on the keyboard, or this is what the paper is going to look like. Um, you're going to do math. Here's some of the math questions, but not a lot of focus on that. So we did, I think, across the district, enough test prep so that kids could feel comfortable going in there um, and feel comfortable that um, it was similar, if, if not exactly the same, as the curriculum that we cover in the classroom. And we showed you results last year that more kids responded for the most part. It looked like what they were, what they were doing in the classroom. D uh, Dr. Alessandri. What are we thinking for this year in terms of electronic testing? 
Um, Dr. Bordy has already given, and I have already discussed this, and she's already had to give the answer to the state. So what's going to happen is grades six through eight will do um, online testing, just like they did last year. Um, the Bishop School will do online testing, just like they did last year. Um, the Peer School will do online testing grades three, four, and five. And the other um, elementary, five elementary schools will do online testing for grade four, which was the expectation that came down from the state. <coughs> um, in order to be prepared for that, we purchased Chromebooks um, for all of the elementary schools that, that are not Thompson. Thompson's one-to-one, -one, so those kids get to use devices all the time. Um, we purchased cr enough Chromebooks for all the fourth graders at each of the other elementary schools. Um, and those schools are working with them. Uh, they, they've had them for two or three weeks now. So grades four and five, even though um, three, four, and five are all working with them, even though four will be the only grade that will take it online at some of the schools. Um, Bishop um, teachers were just as happy to do it. And as a matter of fact, when we introduced iReady, which was the new assessment tool that we're using at Bishop, grades four and five, they were like, as long as it's online, we'll do it. So their experience with online testing was um, so positive that uh, they, as long as it was online, they were willing to sign up for something else. So I, th I thought that was really speaks well to their positive experience. Thank you. Uh, so I know that last year we said we were just going to test this test, right? And we were not going to stress too much about it. And what I'd be interested in hearing from teachers what their perspective was, because we heard a lot from teachers earlier about what their worries were. Um, and so it'd be really interesting to hear sort of, okay, some of those worries were realized and others were not and just have a better sense. And you don't have to answer this necessarily now if you don't know the full thing, but you can if you want. Yeah. Um, out of the 10 years, I thought this was the best test. Um, it was so, so much less anxiety mm -hmm. because when the students realized how shorter the test was time-wise, mm -hmm. they were more willing to put more effort and not be worried about it at all. Mm -hmm. Um, we did practice before and the kids learned how to use the keys and because we were one-to-one -one iPad in sixth grade, the kids were very comfortable with the process. Right. And for my cluster, it ran very smoothly. Mm -hmm. And I, I would, I think online testing is the best over paper. Mm -hmm. Good. I, I mean, I'd also be interested in hearing more about sort of how the park went and how MKS 2.0 is in terms of the content, you know, I from, from teachers at some point. I actually do have data for you that will bring um, one of the future meetings that from the teacher survey that just came back right. from Park, um, and we'll certainly do the same survey for MCAS mm -hmm. 2.0. Great, awesome. Uh, yes, Mr. Hannon. Is the state going forward with online testing for the entire state eventually? They, are they putting the money in the infrastructure for the western part of the state? Do you know? I, I know that there have been grants available um, and monies available for the state um, for those districts that don't have robust Wi-Fi. Um, we have been in contact with them to talk to them about whether we would be eligible or not. We have pretty well, robust Wi-Fi compared right. to... I, I guess my concern is until that is done, until the state is all on electronic, we're not going to have the benefit that was promised to us. Well, you had to get a waiver if you did not want to test grade four online this year. Even the western part? The, whole, the entire state. Mm -hmm. So is Okay, the I guess where I'm coming from is the, one of the, the benefits of this was for us to get the, the data much quicker because it would be online and would be processed. If this still is lacking, we're going to be still in the, the, res, the be talking this at this time of the year. Um, I, I know that the grade four, the, expect, the state sent out something saying their expectation was that grade four would be online, and you had to apply for a waiver no matter but, where you okay, were. Okay, but Next would, year, would we be getting the grade four test results, say, in July? <laughs> well, they haven't said anything. Yeah, so, that was the intent when Park came out. Yes. Well, that's, that's where I'm coming from. I'm not trying I, to belabor it and knock question. us. Thank you. Is, um, I, I, one question is, is the timeout for the rollout for technology the same as it was last year? I think we were all supposed to be using technology completely by 2019 was that right mm -hmm. yeah That's so, so is, that, is that is that the they're same they're rolling or it out every changes? year so it's four grade four this year grades two grades next year i thought three and six so that timing has five. is the same they, they haven't changed anything yeah no they okay. haven't no okay. it's a very strange rollout you'd, you'd look at it and you go like why would you do it that way but there they have i i I don't want to misspeak the grades, but it's one grade this year, two additional grades next year, two additional, and then I think it's everybody the year after that. Mm. Okay. Dr. Allison, Once, I would hope once they rolled out a 
cohort to electronic, they would stick with yes. it afterwards. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, so. They add additional grades. Right. I'm probably So it's probably, if it's fourth this year, then it's probably fifth, fifth and least. something next yeah. year. And then. Yeah, when I said additional yeah. grades, it was additional grades, not, okay. not instead of. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so superintendent's report. Dr. Brady? Thank you. Uh, well, let me just give you a quick update on where we are with the projects. Um, Stratton, we're moving along quite well. We're right on schedule, and we did a lot of work this last week in, in, in the design and colors, and that's now been decided. And uh, w one, of the, um, one of the changes I think will be a very positive one is moving in Stratton to uniform flooring that's going to be similar in care that we have at Thompson. Not similar in pattern, but similar in care. So that, that was a, a great um, uh, turn of events, I think. That would make things better. It'll make it very bright uh, to have all the same, except for the cafeteria, but it's slightly different. So Stratton is going along just fine, and um, uh, going on to Thompson, the, the very good news, of course, is that uh, town meeting overwhelmingly mm -hmm. voted for moving forward with the Thompson addition. With the exception of five people. Except <laughs> for five people. Don't dwell on that. <laughs> Let it go. Don't complain. <clears throat> but it was, it was, it was, it was a very, it was great overwhelming support. And so we are really poised because of the work we've done to be ready to move forward right away. Um, the contract for the, con for the contractor has been awarded to a company called GTC. So that's moving forward. They're working with our owner's project manager and architects. Um, I'm probably by the next meeting, I can give you more, uh, a little bit more of a timeline and where, where we are on that. Gibbs, uh, quite a bit of work has been going on there. Um, already had, um, I sent out an email to all parents. I think I, I sent you a copy of that, where we are in terms of setting the priorities. And I do, and I will get that on the website. I'm not sure if we put the, Karen, did we put the um, priorities up, the guiding principles for Gibbs? I'm not sure we did. All right, let me, let me get those and, and get them up on the website. But essentially, through these forms that we've had with um, the teachers, with parents and eating, and some suggestions from uh, Thompson parents, the guiding principles for the Gibbs has been uh, determined. And you know, there, and I talked a little bit about that last time as well, but I do, we can get it up on the website, which we do have for the Gibbs project. And um, one thing I discovered when I was at Thompson is that not everybody knows we have that. So we're going to get that into a quick link, so I don't think we've, we have it quite there yet, but um, it's- I think it's gonna it's, be hard to find on their website. Well, it's layered, and that's how the website was set up, so we could have some organization to it. But as a result, sometimes you have to go through multiple steps to get there, which I will mention is going to administration, to facilities, and then you go directly to the different school projects. So what I, in fact, just received today were um, more forms to fill out uh, for the architects in terms of really being able to think about all the needs that we would have in terms of programmatic needs, the size of the classrooms, adjacencies, and so forth. So um, actually, just before I came in here, I sent it off to all of the um, curriculum people, people that are in those particular areas of expertise to have them start working on them. So that's going along uh, quite well. Um, the other part about Gibbs is that there will be some draft drawings from the work that's going on currently that people will be able to see in December. I don't have a date yet, uh, but it probably will have a date. Certainly by the November 10th meeting, I think, we'll have a date set for that. And there'll be a chance to you know, ask questions, get comments, because if there's any tweaks that need to be made, then that has to be done in a very short time frame so that by January we're ready to move forward. Okay. Um, the high school, 
in your packet you have a list of what were all the dates for documents that needed to need to go to MSBA as part of this module and all of them have been, the dates have been met and all the, all of the res, the deliverables we are meeting with them and we'll be having some enrollment meetings over the next um, you know we had one today we'll have another one we're all looking at data and um, but one of the but one of the things that we will talk about later is unlike unlike um, elementary schools <coughs> the design number of high school has a little bit less uh, of an impact on what the size of the school is because you're at, at the high school level your educational program also determines spaces that you have in the school and so that's why that part of it is so key so for example you know if you want to have a you can have different kinds of maker spaces you can have what they call clean maker spaces which are more computer driven you could have that your own that space that's part of your curriculum you could have more of an industrial arts wood shop type of um, uh, maker space so it's really l looking deeply at what the programming is going to be and th and the teachers will are working on that we're all working on that and have we I will be able to share with you some of that documentation probably in the next month. But there will even be more of intensity on that piece of it as we go into the spring, in which case we have, uh, when we get the designer, they will have an educational planner, and we will be reaching out to the community, to parents, <coughs> and having more forms about you know, their, their thoughts on this. So it's quite a process once we are able to get into the feasibility stage. Um, so that's basically where we are. We're moving along quite well. Do and you want to um, remind people when we expect to get into the feasibility stage? Well, I think the earliest, well, first of all, to be invited, I don't want to presume, but we're moving along quite well. Um, I think the earliest probably would be at their January meeting. The board meets once a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to have, you know, we're, we're fine with all our documentation. We're right on there. So that, that could be a possible date. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cardin? Um, so some of the members of the, the building committee are wondering when they're going to have their first meeting. And also, I was also wondering why the committee hadn't been announced yet. Um, well, it's part of all the documentation. Um, MSB will let us know when we can release that information. Um, and we will, as soon as we are given the green light to do that. So... Yeah, I mean, Belmont had had multiple meetings before the end of the feasibility period. They were involved in reviewing all of the documents that were submitted. It just doesn't make sense. It's just all, you know, at, at least getting, at least having a meeting to, so they can get to know each other. I, I don't see well, why we're waiting off, waiting for the, that. The town manager and I have talked about having a meeting formed um, sometime this fall to talk about the process. When we, when we interviewed people this summer, um, we, we were pretty clear that, that while we had to form the committee then, the, probably the work of it wouldn't really be starting until we got into feasibility. Um, I, I can't comment on what the process Belmont underwent, but I have specifically asked that question. And I'll eventually have you, the You asked like to whether they could have a committee, you could have a committee meeting? Oh, no, 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 the committee meetings that publicize all of the documents and the... Right. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that's different. That's different. Yeah, publicize the committee too. I haven't. Well, I, I guess if you have a, a meeting, then you're publicizing who's on that meeting, since these meetings are it's a, it's open a, and public. It's, it's a public. Right. It's a public meeting. It's a public and as meeting. Soon as the document hits the table, it becomes a public document. So we can't yet release the list of people who are on that. Well, I mean, we can file a. I can file. I can file an information request tomorrow and get that information, all of that information. So it's a little bit, a little That's bit true. silly. I, I, I'm fine with putting out there, I, I, but I'm just following the guidelines. I will, I will ask now. We had um, one last certification done on the committee list, and um, I will ask our liaison project manager tomorrow and, and see if we can do that. But I specifically asked about the other documents, and the answer is no. Yeah, I think, I think what they want to do is to get you through the enrollment piece first. And I think Belmont is, um, Belmont is almost five months ahead of us in the process because mm -hmm. they were one of the first. And so that's not surprising that they have a lot of that on the, the website right now. 
So uh, moving on. Um, so the enrollment class size, you, you have, these are, I want to just stress that, and that's why we don't date them October 1, but it's dated October 14th, where we are with our enrollments. And, and to our conversation earlier, I think you can start to see where there's been some changes, in, in particularly at the kindergarten, it's obvious. Before, I think we were all 22 to 24, and now it's widening, to, it's not widening up, but it is widening down, because if you look at the, the number, um, we are uh, 36, uh, no, I said 32 less than we were in early September, and that's exactly to what we were talking about, is that you go through and you compare your class list to um, whether students are actually going to be in your school. So that's all we, that always happens, and that's exactly why uh, the state doesn't go with your September 1 numbers, or whatever your start date is. So um, the, we'll have, what happens now, and, and it is happening, is that these numbers all go to the state. They look at to see where there's, you, have, you might have the same student. I mean, it could still adjust. Usually it's only a couple at this stage. But you know, it'll adjust to see, well, it turns out that you have this student with this asset number, but they have the same one in Taunton. So where is the student? And that's what happens. Yes, Dr. Allison Abbey. Um, I'm wondering if we have looked historically at retention from grade five to grade six on an individual student level, and if we could be doing that going forward. I'm wondering if as we change the model of the middle school mm -hmm. and stuff, I'm suspecting that whereas in the past we've had a certain number of students go out, I suspect we'll keep more, more of them are going to be staying in. Mm -hmm. and. I'd like us to be able to be tracking that because I think it would be a good thing as we build our budgets mm -hmm. to use to advocate for the funds that we need to educate these students. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good to look at on an individual student level, not just the whole, you know, how many, what was the cohort here, what was it there, um, knowing not, that there's going to be ins and outs. I'm not sure what you mean by individual because we have retention rates between every grade. Right, but that's historic. just looking at the lump, you know, how many right. students are there in grade five, and then how many oh, students Oh, you mean because there's move-ins, and then there's people yeah, who there's don't. Move, and right. right. Who oh, don't I see what you right. mean. And I'd, I'd like to students. know, and, and I think we've got a better handle on student enrollment and data and stuff now with the, the new data mm -hmm. people and stuff. That and, and central registration, I, I think we're at the point where we can start doing some of these more nuanced. It's more nuanced than we can, yes. Yeah, and I just think it'd be good to start tracking, and then as the Gibbs opens, you know, if we see, oh, look, all of a sudden we're. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Mr. Hainer. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at the totals down below, we've we're been talking about adding space modulars or addition to Hardy, and you look over at Bracket, does Bracket allow for that growth? Bracket is, the numbers here says Hardy's 451, Bracket is 461, so. Bigger building. Well, I, we talk about a bigger building. I mean, is this something that, is it gonna allow for the potential growth going forward? Or is well, this something we have to anticipate in the future? Well, if you look at Bracket, mm -hmm. you'll see that you have four classes at fifth grade. Right. So if that class of four goes out and you have a class of four come in, we're at parity. The problem is the following year. When you'll have a fifth grade with three, if the three goes out and four comes in, we're down one. So next year bracket will be fine. I'm thinking farther in the future. I'm, I'm just, we go to the town, we've done Thompson. We're already giving, starting to talk about Hardy. We need to look at the big plan going forward. I, I look back at Dallin, the total numbers are still lower, but I look at, uh, at uh, the third grade at Dallin has the same amount of uh, class, students, three classes, that's four classes over at Bracket, which both have 77. Right. I mean, space is at a premium. I'm just, I guess what I'm asking, I should have asked it better. We need to look at the whole system as a whole, where we're going to have this growth and if it continues. Uh, right now, the town seems to be focusing, and we seem to be focusing on just East Arlington. I don't know whether this, we talk about a wave going up forward, 
to the other part of town. It looks like it may happen. That's all. I'm not asking yeah, for yeah. an answer I'm, or solution right I'd now. I'd rather not talk about forward. right now. Yeah. Yep. That's, That's all. Good. Thank you. But we will, and we are. So I, I just wanted to, mm -hmm. the point I made earlier, which is that it was very notable that three of the schools had very different numbers, September 16th and October 14th. And just to look at what, um, is there a way that we can create a process that we can get that information earlier um, when we're making decisions about buffer zones and so forth? We're working on that. The, the one of the really the only, there's two ways. One is that parents really need to understand how important it is to notify us, and you know I'm going to ask the building principals to make sure they message that out. I think that's the best place to come rather than centrally. That's one issue. Another is that um, our it, it indefinitely did improve this summer. We have our elementary secretaries now full time. And so we're, we're better, you know, because what, what could have happened in the past if the secretary wasn't there, that somebody might have left a voicemail, but it might have been heard mm -hmm. for a while. So mm -hmm. we have a little bit better um, uh, communication potential there than we did have. Other than people letting us know, it's really hard to, to get that earlier unless we have those two things happening. Right. You could have better messaging in June, potentially. Better messaging in June. And some parents are great. They'll, they'll tell their school that we're thinking of moving. I just want to let you know. I'll let you know in July. Right. And they, they, they do. I mean, in fact, the vast majority of parents do that. And, and I just think that when people get in, in moving, sometimes it happens quickly. And sometimes it just doesn't even cross their mind. It's in the summer. Right. So they're out of school, and they don't think about it. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, and then um, actually, Rob, you're going to talk about the kindergarten TAs. Sure. Um, so there's just a, a list of all the TAs for kindergarten and what their FTEs are and um, which schools have full-time and where the full-time kindergarten TAs are. Yeah. And what the total FTE and cost is. Right. So, I mean, there's really not too much to say. There's one clarification, I think. I, I, I was doing this okay. earlier and was just putting some notes on a few of the, without identifying people. Um, the, the retirees could probably work more than 0.5, but they are just 0.5. They could not work full time because of the hour restriction. Um, but they potentially could probably work more than, between 0.5 and um, under full time. Um, but so just to clarify that. Ms. Starks. Um, I think what would be more useful would be to know which classes I could care less who they are and how much they make. <laughs> um, more important is I don't understand why at Thompson and Hardy, which have the highest class sizes, don't all have 1.0 TAs when all of their classes are 23 and 24. And so it seems really haphazard where some schools have half-time TAs for their classes. Like Bishop are all half-time, and they have 23 and 24, and yet Thompson has some full-time and some half-time. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Why? I would rather know, oh, this class of 24 at Bishop has a full-time or a half-time. Like, I, I want to know where they are and why. Like, how are we making this decision? Okay, well, Because it doesn't make mm -hmm. any sense to me at all what, how we've allocated these. Well, take the examples of Hardy and Thompson. Um, well, let me back up further. One of the things that the principals really try to do is to, is to schedule specials out of, out of classroom art and music PE in the afternoon and for kindergarten. And the reason why is that we ha they know they have a TA in the morning and we want the, t the, the teaching assistant to be there during the literacy block. So actually having a TA in the afternoon obviously would be desirable if we, but if when I've talked to the principals of both schools, having two half time can work quite well in terms of sharing 
between um, classrooms. So sometimes, why this is not a perfect system is that sometimes um, you could have a decision made in early August based on the numbers then and they shift. And that can happen, and it does happen. So we try to be very careful, we wait, we wait as long as we can, but on the other hand, while we often look for our teaching assistants in August, given the job market today, we, we might want to start earlier, uh, but August is usually the time we would particularly do it. So we make decisions then, and they may not pan out, but then we've already hired the person. So. That's why our data, that's why the data is so important. I, I would say that we've done, a, this, I'm not uncomfortable with the way we have it this year. Um, it may be that what we will find is, again, you also don't know um, the chemistries or the needs of a particular class and what, what, what can happen, and does happen during the school year, principal will say, this particular class really needs to have another, you know, another, more support, and then we ask the teaching assistant if they're able to do it. So that will happen also. Astra, that was my question. Is this entirely based on, or the initial assignments based on class sizes, or is it also based on the perceived need of that class in terms of? Well, it's also believed on the perceived need. And so it's one of the things, for example, at Thompson, that's probably the school where we have the <coughs> largest percentage of students that do not have preschool experience. So when students don't have preschool experience, they're coming in with a, a different, um, the, uh, with different needs because they've never been in a school model. They may, been pre they may have been in daycare. That's different than actually being in a preschool. So that, I will say that number's going down, but it's still the case. So if your numbers are getting a little bit higher there and you also have a higher ELL population, so those are factors that go into mm -hmm. the discussions. Clearly, we don't know who the kindergarten students are. Right. <clears throat> We've done screening, but that doesn't really tell us right. a lot. I will also say, though, that sometimes we do know what, who the students are, and they may be students that are coming from the preschool, <clears throat> and we already know where they're going to be, mm -hmm. and the preschool tells us that it's really important that that, that, that and it may even be in the IEP. So it's, it's a fairly complex decision making. And um, believe me, if principals didn't feel that where they were, what they had right now is adequate, I would hear about it, for sure. Right. Also, if, if students are coming from the preschool with, in their IEP with the need for a one-to-one, -one, right. that's a, another that's TA. That's a separate person. That's a separate right. person. Yeah, sure. There are also some principals who, at least during the first few weeks of school, tapped into their own budget to pay some of their TAs to stay the whole day for just for the early right. school year transitions mm -hmm. um, and then have sort of um, backed off on that as the mm -hmm. students get more accustomed to, mm -hmm. to school. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And that's something we, we need to look at too, if whether that does make sense, but I, it does happen in some schools. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, and really not much else other than to remind you on Saturday at 11 is the uh, yes. Inside Out. I don't know if you've gone by Addison to see all of the... Uh, Do we know the rain prediction? It's supposed <laughs> to be bad. It's supposed to be bad. bad. Oh, that's horrible. On Saturday? Is there any chance that we would... It's supposed to be sunny. No? Yeah. Is it? It's sunny. Oh, oh okay. let's not worry about the okay. weather. Okay, yeah. right. So, <laughs> um, in the case of really awful weather, would we reschedule or? I'm not sure what we do. Have a tent. <laughs> Can't just throw up a tent Can't easily. Can and say you have a tent? <laughs> okay, well, so I, we, we I don't think there's the good weather. Okay, okay. I don't know the good, answer. Good, good. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, then the AYCC gala on the November 17th. Again, just a reminder about that event. Yes. And um, you know, we, we can. Um, I think you can come and get tickets at night, but you can certainly go on um, AY, AYCC website get tickets. Now, the thing I want it might be a lure for everybody. The guest speaker is David Axelrod. So, anyway, that's it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And as a reminder, we had had a regularly scheduled school committee meeting. We are not 
having that meeting um, because of the AYCC benefit, which means that our earlier meeting in November is going to be longer than usual. And so just as a warning. Are we starting it early? Well, actually, we might want to raise that question, and it, I defer to the feelings of the committee whether we want to start earlier um, or we want to start our normal time and just potentially go later after 10 o'clock. Yeah, Mr. Hainer. I would defer to those that have a regular working schedule. Yeah, you know, I, to, to I those. Would too. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah. I am amiable to mm -hmm. their needs. Mm -hmm. Like, Any strong feelings on that matter? As long as we get it on the calendar, we just, I mean, as long as right. we know in I mean, advance. Well, you and Paul, I think, have to come the farthest. Dr. Allison Abbey. It's very difficult for me to get here before 6.30. Difficult to get here before 6.30, okay. And Mr. Schlichtman, I know that's the case yeah. for you yeah. as well. Um, anything else? So Keep it there. So let's keep it at 6.30, and there's a chance, probably a very good chance, that we'll have to um, extend. Move, extend it past the 10 o'clock, um, just because we're sort of doing two, two meetings in one on that day. And there's no meeting on the 17th. And there's no <coughs> meeting on the 17th, right. Right. Okay, let's go. Do you have anything else? Anything else? Go on. No? Okay. Um, okay, so the Mass Delegate Assembly, um, uh, this is my fault. Let me just explain my fault. <laughs> I knew that we had to vote on this in October. I didn't rec realize that the date for having to vote on this uh, and to send it over <coughs> to... Um, MASC was earlier than the second meeting. And so what I have done, and I, I'm taking full responsibility of this, is that I have um, submitted uh, Mr. Schlickman as um, our delegate with Mr. Hainer as our backup. So moved. <laughs> um, so, so I've already done this, but I want to make sure I, make uh, that I tell you that and that we, I guess we make it official. So uh, all those in favor of being okay with what I already did. <laughs> Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. It's unanimous. Great. Um, thank Except you for your you understanding on that. Paul is the uh, delegate. The, right. Paul is the delegate. No, Mr. Hainer is the. Um, I seconded. He second made the motion. Is the We're kind alternate. of tired. Of the time. Um, from what I understand, uh, uh, Paul and uh, uh, Mr. Schlickman and Mr. Hainer are both going to be there. I'm actually going to be there for part of it, but not for the whole thing. Um, I don't know if anyone else is planning on attending. Okay. It's, it's tricky because it's in the middle of the week, I think, yeah. to get away. Um, and Dr. Bodie, I know, is going to be there for part of it, but not for all of it as well. Um, okay, good. Uh, moving on to consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted in one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant number 17060. Dated 10-13-2016, total amount $777,323. Approval of minutes, school committee regular minutes, 10-13-2016. Uh, so moved. Okay, do we need to second that? Second. Okay, we just second. Okay, uh, seconded by Mr. Slickman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I uh, opposed? Or, okay. Um, okay, so policy to review as we discussed last meeting um, this is sort of going to be a standard thing on us to make it easier to um, to uh, find policies um, in the in the Nova system but as I understand we have no policies to review. not tonight right not tonight um, okay uh, moving on to subcommittee and liaison reports and announcements okay. uh, budget dr. Alice Nappy budget budget in your packet you'll have um, so budget met on Tuesday, mm -hmm. um, and we came up with a draft budget calendar, which is in your packet, um, and um, it's been it's basically last year's calendar with adjustments made for this year's timing. Um, the few things that we've changed, we added hearing from the AEA as an official mm -hmm. item. Um, under the priorities last year, my recollection is that we did hear from the AA, but it was kind of they spoke during public participation mm -hmm. or something. And we at the Budget Subcommittee felt that it was a reasonable mm -hmm. thing to actually have them on the schedule and on the uh, agenda. Mm -hmm. So we don't know which day they'll be in. Um, Dr. Bodie uh, will work out the details. Um, 
we sketched in some dates for when you'll receive various things and when we'll meet with FinCom. Other than that, it, it's a calendar. Great. Okay. Um, and oh, the one thing that you should know, um, Dr. Bodhi already sent everyone an email about this, but we've received information about the end of year report. Um, and because of the personnel situation um, and the staffing over the summer, um, we're going to ask that if people have any questions about this report, that they email the questions to Dr. Bodie by the November 3rd deadline, and then they'll be answered at the following meeting. Um, just those questions. It's not clear we'll have someone who's ready to answer questions on the fly. So look, uh, look at the report, and if you have questions about it, email them, and they'll go to the person who um, f created the report for this year because it's not Ms. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Just to d differentiate, we're talking about the end of the year report, not the, the uh, right. monthly financial. No, this Thank is you. the end of the year report. Uh, not right. the what, This sorry? is for the end the of monthly the monthly financial. Oh, not the monthly, right. This is about the end of the re right, year right, report. Right, the one we just received. Yep. Right. right. That's going to the state. Right. Thank right. You. Um, and the other thing that we discussed, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the other stuff later. Um, so that's the calendar. Any questions, comments on the calendar? No. Okay. Um, so the other thing we discussed was it's the budget subcommittee's feeling that we should again do a needs-based budget as we did last year, which was new last year. Mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Bodie was in accordance with that when I talked to her a week before and then when we talked to thing. But one of the things that came up in our discussion is kind of what are the questions behind our needs-based budget? You know, what's, what's the questions that the principals are supposed to be thinking about as they create their budget. Um, some ideas that came up as we discussed it were, is this item necessary for closing the achievement gap? Can we justify this request to taxpayers and how or why? Um, will students suffer if we don't have this? Um, but I thought I'd like to hear from the rest of you about what your ideas are. Um, and you can either say now or you could send an email or, or come to the next budget subcommittee meeting. Um, it's not, I just thought this is, it, it's actually, it's a good thing to be thinking about. And I think, you know, the achievement gap is good because it does, it relates back to the goals. But I wonder if there's other things. Um, sort of related to this um, and sort of not, in last year's budget items, when we did the needs, the unfunded, I mean, some of the unfunded stuff, we put them, we indicated that they fell, if they fell into one of four buckets, because we had a lot of things that fell into these four buckets. And those buckets were enrollment growth, high need students, essential curriculum, and unfunded mandates. Mm -hmm. And so another thing that we're going to want to be thinking about as we go forward is, do these buckets still fit? Um, should we change any of the buckets? Or, you know, what we're trying to do is communicate our budgetary needs and, and what our requirements are for the schools to people outside and do it in a way that gets the information across. And I th felt that this, having these four buckets indication was something that was actually really helpful when you sat down with people and said, you know, this, this is why we need this and, and see, and this is why we have so many of the, we're having so much enrollment growth and this is driving so many of these things. Um, but maybe we have other ideas this year. So, okay. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Well, you know, one reaction <clears throat> I have is, would that, I, I would like to see, you know, what is it that we would be able to do that we're not doing now? programmatically kind of spelled out. So if we had more uh, staff, we could do a better job of uh, 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 in, in, in social emotional uh, uh, responding, uh, responding uh, to the social uh, emotional needs of our students. Uh, if we had more staff, we would have smaller class size. If we had, you know, kind of like a, it, fe it feels like to me, rather than just put that information out there in the, 
in the book that ends up going to town meeting and to the public, we'd sort of have a, a why statement. You know, a why, why is this, what will this allow the town of Arlington to do differently than it's doing now? What would we be doing better than what we're doing now? Because <clears throat> um, some people take a look at that and they say, well, you know, the Arlington schools are highly rated, the, uh, the test scores are strong, uh, the students do well, most students uh, you know, many, many students go on to uh, post-secondary studies. Um, I, don't, I, don't see, I, don't, I don't know why this is, you're showing me this. So I think there should be context. You know, what is going to be different and better about our schools if we were able to do all these things? Okay. And I haven't, I haven't thought about what the buckets are yet, but I think, I think you get the idea. Yeah, that, that's, that's a helpful big picture idea. Yeah, it's idea. a big picture, yeah. And, and, you know, the buckets thing is kind of separate. Yeah. But I think we need to give the public a sense of um, where we're treading water and where we're increasing programs um, in response often to either changes in our needs. So for example, uh, social emotional issues become a much greater concern. Those are our needs that have changed or in response to new state mandates that we have to you know, follow. Um, but. Uh, but there are other places where we've increased things, but, but we're just treading water. Say, you know, if we add a bunch of our students, we have to add more math coaches, more mm -hmm. literature coaches, mm -hmm. you know, literacy mm -hmm. uh, courses and stuff um, to just tread water, right? Mm -hmm. So to have a better sense of, um, uh, you know, we can't satisfy these requests to even tread water, <laughs> or we can't satisfy these requests to meet the needs that um, that we feel have changed. Okay. Yeah. So that. That to me is kind of a different, that's a different way of communicating things and that I think that could be useful right. as we go forward and we're talking about the budget to have something which kind of give, captures that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the other thing I'd say is that going forward, and this year might not be the year to do it, it just might be too short of time, um, but we are potentially looking in the future at greater increase in spend, spending on education by the state if this millionaire's tax passes. I mean, these are all ifs, 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 and not right away, but, but you know, five years down the line, we might have more money for education. Um, we have a population that is... Um, increasingly interested in education, you know, wants to, to see certain things in our school system. Um, what would those things cost were we to get those windfalls later on? I mean, and again, it's very speculative, but, but to have a better <coughs> sense of what, what those things might cost. Okay. Yeah. So if anyone else has any thoughts afterwards, um, just send them via Karen, I guess to me via Karen or something. Um, or come to our next budget subcommittee. So Thank you. Great. Um, okay, so community relations, Ms. Starks. Um, let's see. We met uh, last Friday, um, and we talked about the dashboard, which is probably coming uh, in the new year. It looks good. There were just a couple of uh, pages and things that we still want to pull together <coughs> so we don't have to have, like, big under-construction signs up there. But um, So we're looking forward to that. Um, we talked a little bit more about uh, later start times at the middle school and high school and kind of how that's going and what's going on with that and kind of what our role might be. Um, it looks like there are going to be four negotiations, which I know are not this year, but are next year, that this year there's going to be um, a lot of uh, focus on doing a lot of the research beforehand and that start times might be included in that and we just kind of made sure that if there is any kind of research that goes on that some some people on the um, in, uh, right negotiation team might be invited to be part of that research it's not it's not necessarily negotiations but we want to make sure that we are also invited into helping to do that research right do you want to talk more about this committee so as I understand there are teachers who are going to be um, talking about just studying this, these <coughs> issues and talking about them. Um, well, we have been we have been discussing uh, this issue that there, there are a number of issues out there that we might want to start doing some research <coughs> and thinking about this year in anticipation of next year, so that everything is not scrunched into one year. And so we're working on that, and we'll probably. Um, probably by the, we're not, we're not thinking of really beginning until after the first of the year, 
or something like yeah. that. Yeah. And so then the question becomes, who on the school committee is potentially interested in being on that committee? Mr. Hainer? Well, we should well, what we should do is on is the negotiations yeah. committee. And yeah, so let's look at the, the okay. let's look at who's on the negotiations. <laughs> so one of the things is that the, this year's negotiations committee, the sort of people signed up for it sort of knew they wouldn't have a lot of work to do in a way. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's look at who's on there and um, let's also uh, um, ask people to just think about the role and see who might want to be played Right, that, right. And, and I think once mm -hmm. they know what kind of things they're looking at researching, that yeah. Dr. Bodie will bring that here, and yeah. then yeah. people can kind of decide. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we also talked about um, forums, if we wanted to have any forums, um, and kind of what was going on. Um, we know that uh, in November uh, that uh, the Vision 2020 is sponsoring the Most Likely to Succeed video. Um, and we don't want to like over, and then because the um, curriculum, the Common Core stuff didn't end up on the ballot, mm -hmm. we didn't feel like we needed to have a forum educating anybody before that. So um, we're kind of looking into um, a couple of ideas um, in kind of like maybe, uh, I would guess I would call it late winter, and then maybe one in kind of middle of spring. Um, and we're kind of throwing around some ideas there. Um, and the other thing we threw around, um, and I guess I just kind of want to bring it back here as well, is um, thinking about possibly having some kind of school committee open office hours, kind of in a public place, even if it was just an hour a month or, I don't know, every other week. But if we each shared it, no one has to be there very long, but it'd be kind of like, you know, come meet a school committee member and ask them a question. And I mean, it can be in a public place like, you know, um, kickstand or a Dunkin' Donuts or something like that. And just, you know, so that, I don't know, I feel like we know our groups of mm -hmm. friends right. maybe mm -hmm. and acquaintances. For those of us out of the schools, not maybe not so many people that we talk to in the schools. Mm -hmm. And I think that I want we want to make sure that People feel like we're reachable. Like, mm -hmm. yes, our our addresses and phone numbers and emails are online, but if people want to put a face with that and really want to have a conversation about something, that th there doesn't seem to you know be a time for that. And we kind mm -hmm. of want, we're thinking, and so I just wanted to know what people thought about that because that was something that Jennifer and I have been throwing around, and and we brought it up again this year. Mm -hmm. um, the state reps do that. They, yeah, they, they, exactly. they, 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 sometimes they just sit there and there's nobody there and they yeah. drink their coffee. Sometimes they'll have two or three people waiting. Yeah. I think it's a good idea. I mean, if we did it even just once a month, literally, it would be like we would each have to do it one month, right. you know, in the, in the months that we meet. It would almost be fun to have two of us there so that yes. we could have a conversation. Yeah, 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 that, yeah. That, that would be well, in that way, worst case, if you're, no one shows up, at least you have somebody <laughs> yeah. to have coffee with, too, you know. Dr. Allison Um so I like the idea. I do remember I asked something similar to that when we were going through the whole governance thing. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, um, Nancy Walzer didn't think it was a good idea, hmm. like like it was a bad idea. And okay. I never, I- I can I'm check with her. Well, yeah. um, just, that was what I understood she to say, but I didn't understand the why. why? I, I right. totally didn't understand we, it. Okay. And no, I'm, I'm, and I'm not saying, I think we can just do it. It, it was yeah, just- yeah. Try it. Yeah. Yeah. Is so it the, uh, perhaps the budget for us to have coffee and donuts. <laughs> we might have to buy our own coffee. <laughs> um, why doesn't uh, community relations come up with a schedule, possible schedule? Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll take that on then. We'll yeah. see if we can come up with a schedule. That'd be good. Probably start in the beginning yeah. of the year, just, yeah, so that mm -hmm. we can actually plan it. And then mm -hmm. we don't have to ask, do we? The, place that we're going to no. do no. it. We don't have to ask. So. <laughs> the only thing is, wherever we do it, it should be consistent. Okay. So that, they so know that, to find in other it. words, if we're going to publicize this, mm. we don't want to move it from right, where right, you want right, it, where right, I want right, it, where right, Jeff right. wants it. Okay, right. I, don't, I don't know. I'd say moving it around town wouldn't be a bad thing. As so they can't they find publicize it? it. Yeah, well, no, so that so it's people, not always in the same neighborhood. From the Heights go to different coffee shops than mm -hmm. people in East Arlington, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. I, uh, Dr. Allison, I did something like this for one of my campaigns, mm -hmm. and I did actually ask people, but I can tell you that all the 
restaurant and okay to the restaurant owners were incredibly welcoming and oh sure the other one was kind of confused but yeah (laughs) (laughs) i I did it too Uh, i didn't ask though (laughs) i i I asked and and they were um fine with it i can tell you kickstand was totally fine with it yeah um i would ask as you do a schedule can it would be easier if it's like loose you know it doesn't have to be you on a certain day it's just if i mean you can th- you have a schedule but if 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 you have to swap you know right, instead right. of advertising yeah. that's going to be oh no, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of her, yeah, yeah it's like it would be school two school committee members yeah. will yeah. be right. here exactly yes. 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 that makes sense we'll try right. to get people sense. to sign up yeah. okay yeah. all right so we'll we'll in our next meeting we'll try to see if we can pull cool. that together great that's it uh district accountability curriculum instruction and assessment uh, no report okay uh facilities I have no Come report. In. We really haven't found. There has been a need to meet. It feels like all the stuff is happening and we're nothing getting good reports. The There's nothing happening. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody that means it's happening. happening. Nothing we're happening at the building. I'm getting reports here. I may give you something later. Oh, well, okay. But we're getting Do we reports. have enough duct tape to make it through the year? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, we do. We do. Plenty of duct tape. Plenty mm-hmm. of duct tape. Good investment. Uh, policies and procedures, Mr. Hayner. We met on the uh, October 20th and looked at the MASC suggested policy on student activity fees. We agreed on several changes and additions. I'll be sending the revised policy to council for comment. We also looked at several other policies and we'll be asking questions to council to respond to questions that uh, we had in them. It is my hope that we will have a policy for first read at our next meeting, hopefully. Next meeting, uh, maybe not, next meeting is uh, November 9th. We have to look at it then at 5.30 p.m. in this room. Okay. Thank you. Uh, school enrollment task force. Anything to report that so we've had we one meeting? No. Is there an, is, actually is there another meeting scheduled, or is it? We, yeah. no, I think there is another meeting scheduled. There was another one. When is the next? Yeah. It's uh, this Monday, the seventh of November. December. November. So, oh, okay. December, isn't it? So December. eleven December. December. Yeah. Okay. Is November. another meeting? Yeah. Is that um, in town hall? It's here. It's here. here. Okay. Right here. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, warrant committee. Everyone get paid again. Excellent. If I may. Yes. Mr. Uh, I'd like to make a motion and ask somebody to second it uh, to, for purposes of discussion to establish a sh- short-term committee to uh, review and come up with a uh, legal contract. Uh, our contract with council, uh, Stoneman Channel and Miller, expired on June 30th this year, and we're already into new one. You in your pack, uh, in the pile of papers today, mm-hmm. there's a letter that was sent to Dr. Bodie, and I've already talked to do- Dr. Bodie about this. Uh, in, they were writing in anticipation of renewal of the contract. Uh, some of us have talked about it. I'm not suggesting we're not getting our bucks worth, but I think for us to do due diligence is to look over it. I have figures from the past. Uh, this letter here gives a brief outline of what they're looking at. It's an increase of the retainer by $10,000 per year for the work that they're going to be doing and stuff. So I would ask the committee uh, to consider this. And so are, is the motion to form a subcommittee? Is that a subcommittee, a short term and one time to just look at this material and report back to the committee and recommendation for uh, to agree to a contract. Do I have a second? Is there a second? Second. Okay, seconded by Mr. Slickman. Um, discussion on the motion. Yes, Mr. Carden. So it says approved on here. Does that mean it was already approved? That was just for payment. Money. It, had, it oh. had nothing to do with the, the, mm-hmm. the issue. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Dr. Boy, I should have let no, you. No, that's right. That's it was your, your signature. <laughs> Just for a uh, thing, Dr. did Andy. not go back to them. Just to understand, um, so I was part of the original legal services subcommittee. You're not suggesting a big deep dive trying to look at changing counsel or something? No, like that. I'm not. That I'm not. Okay, that's this is not just what I'm suggesting. trying to. I have. Uh, the, uh, they've been. Uh, Council Bryant has been sending us, sending me monthly reports on my request of what has been retained and what has not been retained. I'll have those available if anybody wants to look at. In the uh, the third sheet of this uh, letter was a list of areas uh, that we want uh, that they are recommending to cover under retainer and not retainer. If we're happy with that, if the uh, people that I think uh, special education receives a lot of their services uh, and the other parts. We need to be clear on what we're getting. That's all. So it's kind of contract review. Right. Contract review. I, I, I am. I am. My suggestion is it would probably be one, no more than two meetings. Okay. 
Um, so just for clarity, we're talking about a fairly short committee, one or two meetings. Right, and then um, come back to the committee. And, and, and the motion is for a, meet, a, a committee of three? Two or three, whatever. Two? Or anybody okay. that wants. Okay. Um, so I guess, uh, I guess why does, uh, if, if people are interested in being on such a committee, um, why don't we send, we can probably m make that motion next week, next time we meet send uh, the interest to Karen, myself, and we get a sense of who's interested in being on yeah. such a committee. So. Sound good? Okay, so let's vote on the motion though, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so all in favor of the motion to have a temporary subcommittee to review the legal um, contract, contract with, with Council, with Council. Stoneman, Channel, and Miller. So, yeah, okay. In favor say aye. 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 Okay, you know Thank this. you. Uh, Madam Chair? Yes, On Mr. the Shepin. topic of warrants. Yes. Uh, the Modernizing Municipal yes. Finance and Government Act was passed earlier this year, and one of the things it will permit us to do is designate any one of our members to approve vendor warrants. Uh, I'd like to ask the policy uh, committee to take a look at this. Uh, obviously, vendor warrants aren't an issue during the school year when we're meeting every couple of weeks. Uh, but it certainly is an issue in the summer. Yep. And uh, there, there's sort of a squishy question of whether or not it's one specific member or de or allowing just one member as uh, authorized by the Any committee to, to sign it. So it'll be a little research to this. Mm -hmm. But I think this is something we should avail ourselves uh, on, certainly during the summer uh, time, because uh, it's often hard to get uh, a quorum of four members yeah. to sign the warrant. I agree. Okay, right, so motion uh, to uh, send to refer to policy committee um, the uh, to look at the municipal modernization act that permits a single member to sign a warrant. Yes. Okay. Any discussion Second. on the motion? Seconded by Mr. Hayner. Discussion on the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. It's unanimous. Uh, great. Uh, liaison reports. Yes, Mr. Hainer. Uh, Permit Town Building Committee uh, uh, met. Dr. Bodie covered uh, all the things that they have done. Their next meeting will be on November 1st at the newly renovated Community Safety Building. So uh, I attended an OPEC uh, meeting uh, morning. I'm sorry, I don't have the date, but Matt Coleman, our Math Director gave an excellent presentation regarding program and courses offered to middle school students and, and, and answered parent questions. And last night, uh, Dr. Seuss and I attended a, a METCO meeting in Boston. It's an annual meeting with parents and the superintendent. Um, I, I also attended a stipend committee meeting with Mr. Spiegel, and I think there's a couple more coming up. I have to review the stipends. Any, anything else? Yes, Mr. On, on Tuesday, I participated in a forum with uh, former Representative Marty Walls. Mm -hmm. uh, Walls, not Walsh. Right, um, right. Uh, on the question two, uh, I debated the no side. She did the yes. There was a write-up in the Metro West Daily News, which was one of the sponsors, along with Regis College. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Great. Any other uh, liaison reports? <laughs> uh, any announcements? Yes, Mr. Hainer. Uh, Arlington Rotary, Rotary will be having a dedication on November 6th at 1 p.m. for Flags for Heroes on the front lawn of the Arlington High School. Okay. All are invited. What time? 1 p.m.? Uh, at 1 p.m. We've already mentioned the Inside Out, which is on Saturday, and then the AYCC. I just want to point out the high schools having their play, Peter and the Starcatcher, uh, next weekend. And what, Peter and the Starcatcher? Who's having it? High school. High school. Yes. And, and I'm going to add a little maternal pride. My son is the star of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I am particularly excited about that show. And that's next weekend? That's next weekend. Um, any other oh, I just want, yes. uh, I'm going to have a superintendent's coffee just for people oh, yes, to come and right. talk. I would send the email out. Mm -hmm. um, but just a reminder, it's November 14th. Mm -hmm. And it was from 7.30 to 9 in the teacher's calf of this building. Um, and do you want parents to send questions beforehand if they have it? No. Well, uh, they don't they have to, but if they, they don't have they, to. If they, if they want to, it might. Sure. Yeah. It, it requires data that I might not be able yeah. to answer yeah. it on the spot. Right. I could get back to them. Mm -hmm. Great. 
uh, future agenda items. Yes, Mr. Hainer. My regular one, I'd like a financial report, Dr. Bodie. Right, the monthly meeting, the monthly financial report. It's supposed to be on November 10th. Yeah, November 10th is, awesome. is on the, Thank you. our tentative agenda, which is not yet up. Um, anything, anything else, future agenda items? Halloween is Monday. Nope. <laughs> Halloween is Monday. Great. Yes. Okay. Uh, executive session. Uh, we're going to go into executive session. So you conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. I'm voted to approve the following executive meeting session minutes April 30th, 2015, October 22nd, 2015, November 19th, 2015, January 28th, 2016, March 24th, 2016, May 26th, 2016, and October 13th, 2016. Um, do I read this part again? No. Oh. Well, <coughs> So we need to call. vote to a roll call oh. to go into executive session. Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Is that okay? Do we need yes. a motion are we, first? Are we returning? Oh, we are not returning from executive session. Okay. Yes. And I'm sorry. Awesome. Did you say yes. Oh, so I'm I sorry. Did we, say I didn't. Yes. Um, anyone meant to make a motion to? I'll make to, the motion. Okay. So Mr. Slick is making a motion. Uh, Dr. Alison Ampey is seconding it to go into executive session, and we'll do the roll call now. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Aye. Dr. Alison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 And yes. 